is everybody's aware that has been to the front page, Lance is... He noted to me after I had <clears throat> done the daily update today that it's not a boycott. He's quit. He's just done. He's not watching Impact anymore. Ever again. He's got way more sense than the rest of us here. I did say, well, you know, what happens if, say, they get rid of uh, Vince Russo, for example? And we'll talk about it Thursday. But essentially he said, if there's a major change in the booking committee and for an extended period of time it appears that things are better, he'll give it a shot. But the days of the old, hey, you know, I'll give it another shot because things may turn around. No more of that. No more of this may. It will have to have turned around for an extended period of time before he decides he's going to ever watch that program again, which means he's probably never going to watch it again as long as he lives. It's fine. I envy him. I want to send a shout-out as well to Mikey Whipwreck, who I spoke to today. Under sad circumstances, we were talking the death of Canyon, and he wanted me to let the world know that he agreed 100% with Lance. He has also given up on the show... I can't remember what he called Eric Bischoff. For for lack of, of remembering, I'll just say he wanted me to tell everybody that Eric Bischoff is a cocksucker. Hmm. May not have been the, the term that he used, but quite frankly, I don't think that would bother him if he heard me use that term instead. So Eric Bischoff from Mikey Whipwreck, you're a cocksucker. And we'll have him on in the next couple of weeks. Maybe I'll scoop him before Friday when he's going to be on Ed's show. Maybe I'll I'll scoop him and have him on the air first it's before to undercut Ed's show at every opportunity. That's right. That's my job. It's it's like, you know, I, I see myself as as WWE and and Ed as TNA, where you know that's it's a terrible terrible thing to say about it's Ed. Already a one sided ass kicking. Apologize to the but man. But right I now. may as well. Ed's a good human being. I may as well just rub salt in the wound. Ed, I don't think you like TNA at all. <laughs> I apologize, Ed. I'm just fucking with you. I ain't going to scoop the man there's, out from underneath you. There's ribbing, and then there's going way too low, and that was too low. No, come on now. There's no such thing as too low after watching Impact. That was as low as you can go. I mean, literally, that's as low as you can humanly go. What a bad program of, of, uh, of I can't even say professional wrestling. What a... What a uh, I don't even know what to call it. It's it's not even like the Gong Show. The Gong Show was a success. This show is not. So what is this? I don't know. I I can't call it a train wreck. Well, it was a train wreck at points last night. I, That's I, I, undoubtedly true. I don't because I mean we, we you we always talk about you know there have to be changes. They need to make changes, and they never do because they think they have a good show. <laughs> I think that is the problem. They they like their show. They can't understand why anyone would not like their show. What a bunch of dumbasses. Perhaps they will listen and will explain to them why we did not like their show. They wouldn't understand. That's clear. I think that there there must be some very low IQs there. I mean, like... <clears throat> double, some very low self-esteem. Some double-digit IQs. I mean, to watch this show and think it's good. I mean, it would be one thing if if the show were doing a four. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If the show they put on last night did a four, then, you know, maybe we're wrong. Maybe that really is a good fucking show. At least it's a success. But no, when when your show does a horrible number every week, and people say the show sucks, you'd think that you could put two and two together and go, hmm, maybe this does a bad rating because people think the show sucks. And, uh, in fact, the rating is has dropped substantially from their, you know, the, the, a bunch of people gave this show a try back in January. No, and this is even worse than that. This is even worse than people giving them a try in January and giving up. This is the people that actually used to watch every single week on Thursday. The people that we called the hardest of the hardcore fans, the people that would never give up on TNA. They drove them off. Even those people have been yes. driven off. That's astounding. So, so basically, if anybody from TNA listening to this right now in a position of power wants to prove to me that you do not, in fact, have a double-digit IQ, then prove it to me by making a change. Because by doing the same shit over and over every single week with the same fucking results, that to me, low IQ. That's like that's like a uh, what's a really dumb animal? An aardvark? Well, most actually, most know. most animals that are really dumb have long since gone extinct. But if you had a if you had a uh, it was an old Far Side cartoon, 
and this uh, Stegosaurus is meandering around, and there's a it, there's nothing around. It's a wasteland. It's just an empty empty plain, and the Stegosaurus is is wandering around. And of course, there's one tree in yes. the entire plane, and the Stegosaurus runs headfirst into the tree. That's TNA. Except instead of just running into the tree once, the Stegosaurus runs into the tree. He backs up and he walks into the tree again every week for eight years. And then he backs up and he walks into the tree again, over and over and over. And maybe you know, maybe maybe things turn around for the Stegosaurus. Someone gives him a map out of wherever he's at, but he still bunks into the tree repeatedly. You know, someone gives him directions. Perhaps someone actually gets on his back and tries to steer him. But instead, he goes headfirst into the tree over and over again. That's a dumb animal. That's TNA. Mm-hmm. Just it's like that. Uh, so basically, we're begging for a giant asteroid to wipe them out. Was it that? Uh, I think it was. I don't know if it was the penguin or the seal exhibit when we were down in Orlando. And there's all these there's all these animals underwater at Sea World swimming around. Like, just tons of them, and none of them ever run into each other. And I was just astounded that with all of these animals together underwater, they could all swim around like crazy and never bonk into each other. And, it, and like, literally as I'm saying this, one of these fucking animals runs right into the glass. It's a penguin. You've told the story before. Stupid yeah. penguin. Okay? Now, I would guess this penguin doesn't do this on a regular basis, or it would be dead. It's like any other real business. Like any real business would be out of business by now if they were this bad. But now these people just keep bonking into the tree, these dumb fucks, over and over again. And then we get a show like we had on uh, Monday night. I'm not even really mad at the show because, as someone noted, I don't even want to use the same analogy because it, it would be it would be an insult to people who actually are mentally retarded. But this show, you just you can't laugh at it anymore. I never could. You just can't. I just get you can't even it. really get mad at it. Yeah, that, that, you can't even get mad at it. The only, like the, morons are writing this show. The only thing I really got mad at was no, I mean pure legit morons. Oh, I know. Like, like, like. Plural. No, I mean, I'm gonna look up the word moron. Let me tell you who's writing this show. The, the, and this is not a joke. Where if you look up moron in the dictionary, you see Vince Russo. I'm gonna give you the legitimate psychological definition of the term moron. Let me just read this here very quickly. <clears throat> Moron is a controversial term. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> Pardon me. That could make a great drop. Moron is a controversial term once used in psychology to denote a category of mental retardation. The term was closely tied with the American eugenics movement. Once the term became popularized, it fell out of use by the psychological community. So maybe this is a poor term, but I'll just continue reading. Moron was coined in 1910... From the ancient Greek word moros, which meant dull, as opposed to sharp. He used to describe a person with a mental age in adulthood of between 8 and 12 on the binet scale. It was once applied to people with an IQ of 51 to 70. That would, in fact, be the approximate IQ of the people writing this program. Being superior in one degree to imbecile, it's an IQ of 26 to 50, and superior in two degrees to idiot. Which is an IQ of 0 to 25. This is already my favorite B&V episode ever. I am learning. The word moron, along with others including retarded, idiotic, imbecilic, stupid, and feeble-minded, was formerly considered a valid descriptor in the psychological community, but is now deprecated by psychologists. Hmm. So anyway, it looks like... uh, They're morons. Well, I don't know. That may be giving them too much credit. You think they may be imbeciles? That may be an insult to morons. They may be imbeciles or perhaps even idiots. Even idiots. Seriously. Maybe we should make a poll. <laughs> a lot of the people who run I don't want to hear morons, about polls. Imbeciles or, or keys. idiots. Or keys. This is the episode of keys. You were going to say something before I got going on morons? Uh, just the, the, the part that What got... a coincidence, by the way. How dare you? Go on. The part of the show that made me angry was just that I realized at one point there was still like an hour and 15 minutes to go. <laughs> I thought the show was almost done. That's when I got mad. Nope. Nope. It went forever. And it Raw, was... by the way, was not a whole lot better. No, I, I, but not... Raw was at least written by by intelligent people. It, it may someone... not have been wrestled by intelligent people, but it was written by them. I, I, it made a difference. If a fan came to me and said, I, and 
I enjoyed Impact more because it had more and better wrestling. I would not defend Raw. I would not waste one second of my breath defending See, Raw. See, that's the problem. Impact had better wrestling than Raw. It did. But so what? I don't know. If you can't get through the goddamn show because it's so badly written and so just completely idiotic, then who gives a fuck if the wrestling is better? I'm not wading through that bullshit to see a couple of good matches. I would much rather tolerate Raw, which at times was boring, than have to sit through this pile of shit that is Impact. It opened up. This I wrote I, down the entire speech. Did you really? I did. Okay, because sure, I, 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 I just cannot bring myself to do it. Thank it, God you did. It literally takes up my entire screen. Christy Hemme had a microphone. She turned to the camera, and she said these words. Tonight will be the first ever TNA knockout lockbox showdown. The rules are simple. There will be an eight knockout elimination tag match. When a pinfall or submission occurs, both participants are out of the match. However, the winner gets a key to one of the four lockboxes, and the loser walks away with nothing. Later this evening, the four winners will open the four lockboxes containing high stakes. One being Terror's Pet Spider Poison. One, an open contract for the match of their choice against the opponent of their choice. Another, they will have to strip down to their bra and panties and walk around the ring. Last, the grand prize, the TNA knockout title. That's where I stopped. Let's... All I gotta say is that I I gained a new respect for Christy Hemi because I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea how she memorized all that. I don't I, that's a great question. As noted yesterday, I watched that goddamn thing twice. <laughs> I still had absolutely no idea what was going on. I I understood it later after I'd watched the entire show. But I guess really what was most astounding to me is if someone with a brain would have written that, it would have been Easy to understand. Because the match itself was actually not that difficult. But they explained it in such a convoluted, just preposterous manner, that I was certain this had to be a rip. Especially when you started with, the rules are really quite simple. That is the ultimate lie in wrestling. And when everyone <laughs> says the rules are simple, they are lying to you. Well, <laughs> the term total nonstop action is the biggest lie in wrestling. There was, but that was quite a whopper. There was a lot to hate about this. I'm going to pick what, what I hated the most, which was that, per the rules of this match, and in fact, as we later, le later learned, this actually happened, Tara, the TNA Knockouts champion, could kill everyone, destroy her opponent, could, she could have destroyed the entire team and her own partners, pinned one of them, been the most dominant knockout on TNA, and she would still have a 75% chance of losing her title on pure random luck. Yeah. That's fucking dumb. She could have beaten everybody in the match and, because of the wrong key, been rewarded with having to strip. Yes. They all yeah, signed... And, there, and there's also the, the, the classic... It's the same thing in Feast or Fired, where if you win, you risk a severe penalty. But you know what's so funny about it was at the end of the show, Daphne was the one that had to strip. And she didn't want to. And Borat said, well, you signed the contract, you either strip or you're fired. Now, never mind the fact that she never ended up stripping. But apparently a contract had to be signed by each of the girls for this match. Which begs the question, why did Tara sign the contract? I don't know. She did not want to strip. <laughs> she made it very clear in her interview she didn't want to be in the match at all. No. She said it was all bullshit and being done for ratings. She wanted nothing to do with it. Yet apparently she still signed the contract for this match. That makes no sense. I also, what a shocker! I also like that there's a spider involved here. It's Tara's pet spider, Poison, was spider napped by, I believe, Daphne. And TNA somehow recovered the stolen property and rather return it to a rightful owner, put it up at stake in a wrestling match. Mm -hmm. That also makes no sense. None of this show makes any sense. This is a terrible, terrible television show. Then they open up with a title Advantage Team Flare. That's what this show was called. This live show. That makes no sense. How could you title a show before the show started? Well, yes. When it's live. I don't know. And it's supposed to be real. Because I, I, I was trying to remember if Team Flair had the advantage last week, and I don't remember the other impact, but... How absolutely stupid. I'm having an advantage. So Hogan, Jarrett, and Abyss came out. Mike Tanay literally begged us all to call our friends and text them and let them know Impact was on and please watch it. You actually missed Velvet and Madison coming out to talk about the Stips. 
Oh, and you're right. I'm sorry, guys. Yes, Madison said they'd get everything they deserve tonight, and Lacey was excited about the idea of parading around naked later. Apparently, she can only parade around naked if she wins a match first. She can't just walk to the ring and strip. Of course not. We'll stop her. Okay, yes. Yeah, so then Her- Hogan, Jared, and Abyss came out, and Mike Tanay begged us to let everyone know the show was on right now because basically saying, we did a shitty job of advertising this 8 p.m. start time. Please help us. So basically, Hogan and Abyss cut promos. They said they would, their team would win at lockdown. Flair came out with Desmond Wolf, Beer Money, and Sting. Uh, and Chelsea. Chelsea was also still there. Still pushing his wheelchair. Yes. You can't find another generic girl. <laughs> She's so generic, I didn't even make notice of her. So, to make a long story short, they went back and forth for a bit. The heels moved forward to attack. Jarrett wanted to stop. He wanted to ask Sting one question. He uh, asked Sting why. No, he asked Steve. I beg your pardon. He asked Steve why. And Steve responded by hitting him with a baseball bat as Hulk Hogan and Abyss stood there. You know, I think they still believe. I mean, obviously they do. They still believe that in 2010, if you call a man by his real name... Actually, I don't know what they think. I don't care. Do they possibly think that if you call the man Steve, it's a shoot? What do they think? I don't know. I don't, I don't know and I don't Steve. care. Steve! It's dumb. Hey, Steve! <laughs> Steve, you're hitting me with a bat. Stop it. In 2010, Steve. Hey, Steve! Oh, my God. Jeff Jarrett must really be mad at Sting. He He's called gonna, him Steve. He broke character. I need to. I need to call Bill. I need to call and text Bill and Actually, tell him to watch Bill this show. You may believe that. No, that's true. So, so anyway, the heels beat up the good guys here after Hogan and Abyss were finally stirred into action. And uh, RVD and Jeff Hardy made the save. They came through the crowd, which was hysterical because there was a fan who was just trying to get back to his seat who was in their way. That was awesome. I loved it. It took them ten minutes to get through the crowd, and and all the heels just had to stand there like complete idiots waiting for them. Yeah, that too. Yeah, so there you go, and then the the faces through the ring. So and that was one of the better pro. That was one of the better things on the entire show. Think about that. Well, it led to something even better. RVD and James Storm had a real good TV match. Indeed, winner of a segment here. It ended with uh, RVD hitting the split legged moonsault. Thumbs up for this little uh, match right here. And then they uh, Storm broke a beer bottle over his head. Jeff Hardy ran down to make the save. Robert Roode laid him out. So beer money left with their heads held high. RVD was bleeding all over the place because, of course, you've got to have blood on every show now. And I still gave it a thumbs up. Still gave it a thumbs up. I think they could have done half of this this week and, and uh, half of it next week, but who gives a fuck? It thumbs was, up. It was a winner of a match, and yes, there was a, a little, there was a lot of lot going on in the post match. It could have been just James Storm hitting him with a bottle and walking away, and that would have been fine, but I'm not going to complain about this. There are a lot more on this evening to complain about. Chris interviewed Tara, Angelina, ODB, and Hamada. And Tara, of course, as noted, said this whole thing was a joke. TNA wanted ratings. They were doing all this bullshit at her expense. And, uh, yes, as noted, she signed a contract for this, we later learned. Mm-hmm. So Angelina told her there is no such thing as fair in wrestling. Mm-hmm. So if you're watching this for ev- even for the illusion of athletic competition, this is not for you. You can't have that. ODB then outright said, screw the knockouts title. She wanted to have a match with AJ. Mm-hmm. Bury the belt. I realize the the, 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 the the belt is buried in the opening segment worse than this, but she didn't care about it. Well, she wants the world title. And Hamada spoke Japanese, hopefully saying, I can't believe I'm here. I want to go home. Homicide and Rob Terry. Complete bullshit. So, again, today, begging us to call our friends. And what a segment to call our friends on. So, of course... Terry pins him with a power slam. Everybody knows what happens. Homicide goes out, gives him a chair shot to the back. Terry no-sells it. So Homicide just... If you didn't see this, I can't even tell you how hard he hit him in the head with he his chair. We lead the man. He destroyed the chair. Terry was busted open hard way, bleeding everywhere. Just the most brutal fucking chair shot right to the head. The Chris Canyon tribute here on the Indeed. program. Indeed. To the man who'd suffered a number of concussions. And, in fact, I, I just realized this when writing the Canyon obituary that a couple of years ago he'd gone on his MySpace and he was so pissed off that WWE was trying to claim that 
The Chris Benoit thing had nothing to do with head injuries. He was outraged, and he called for a boycott on WWE. So, a couple days after he died, of course, they destroy Rob Terry with a chair shot in 2010, everybody. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, then he no-sold it, and and then Orlando Jordan came out and poured uh, milk all over himself. This show deserves to die. This is such a miserable segment. Not, not like we haven't said that before, but this show deserves to die. I mean, the, the worst, obviously, was the chair shot. And it's not like it's not like only wrestlers, only concussions to wrestlers have been in the news lately. The NFL's cracking down on it. Other sports are very worried. It's If they ever watch the news or read a magazine or newspaper, they should be aware of this kind of thing. Concussions are very, very bad for you. Yeah, but you know what? Even if they don't watch that shit, I don't watch sports. Even if you live in the wrestling bubble, hello? <laughs> Even in the fucking wrestling bubble, you fuckers. And then Just a bunch of stupid morons. I mean, seriously, this show, the story of this show was we don't give a fuck about our talent. Yes. yes. I mean, as noted yesterday, of all the people in this entire fucking company to put in a ladder match, how many injuries has Mitch Kennedy suffered in his career? How many times has Kurt Angle broke his neck? Half a dozen. These are the two guys you decide to put in a fucking ladder match? Hello? Yes. I mean, maybe you could put Kevin Nash in and things might get worse. That's the only person, literally, or Hulk Hogan. I was going to say Hulk. I I actually think Hulk Hogan trying to climb a ladder by himself could be dangerous. Even Ric Flair in a ladder match would would have been better than either of these two. Yes. I mean, with the exception, literally, of Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash who are too smart to have done a ladder match in the first place. These were the the two guys they decided to put in here. You just don't give a fuck about your talent. It's amazing. What a happy family. Do I do I put my my dad in a car without a seatbelt and and uh, roll him down a hill? <laughs> no. For all this talk about what a happy family TNA is, I don't treat my fucking family like this. Put their fucking lives in danger for nothing. Oh, yes, exactly. For They're ab- not even getting ratings. Yes. Do you realize that? They're not even putting fucking people's lives on the line to get a four. No. Not that that would be good, but you're putting people's lives on the line supposedly for ratings, which you aren't fucking you, getting. You get nothing in return. You're not getting any ratings. This is just astounding to me. It's not really, actually. I mean, I'm not really astounded at all. <laughs> this is not news. I guess the news is it's still happening. But this none of this that we're talking about here is the first time. No. If you have never watched Impact before and this I is the first, you. the first show you're listening to, this ain't new, everybody. They do this shit. They don't care about anybody. It's been going on for years. Remember like a month ago, Chris Saban got like knocked out cold? Yeah, and then they put him back in the ring with Team 3D here. Yeah. In the same exact match that he got killed in last time. Yes. So, anywho, we had the knockout lockdown box match, whatever the fuck it was. Um, cut to the chase. Tara, Daphne, Velvet Sky, and Angelina got the got the keys to the boxes later. Daphne pinned Hamada. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it doesn't <laughs> matter, but that is such a crime. <coughs> and my, the, the finish to this... I guess Thank was, God for Hamada. Hamada was probably thinking what... Uh, what um, what's her face? Uh, Maurice was thinking on Raw. Thank God I'm not a part of this. Yes. <laughs> That's, yeah, indeed. So, Lacey at one point, did she's done this before, but she does a moonsault, lands on her feet, and then drops an elbow smash. And she did this move, and Taz said she did a moonsault just to drop an elbow. Yes. He created how this was the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> Taz is my favorite commentator. Yes. I feel for the man. Angle and Kennedy ladder match. You know, and my, my note after this was after, I mean, it was a lot of action. One of the eliminations was during commercial, but we had the opening segment, and then this match, which is just a blur, and I watched this after Raw, which had the evening gown debacle, and looking at the Raw women's talent roster and the TNA women's talent roster, the fact that the TNA women's division is a worse product, inexcusable. Completely inexcusable. Angle and Kennedy in a ladder match for yet another key. Five keys on this show, everyone. They had a hell of a match. Sure. In the middle of absolutely fucking killing each other. If I ever, maybe if I if I come back and watch this again years later, and it turns out Kurt Angle and Ken Anderson are both doing fine, maybe I'll enjoy it more. Yeah. 
But this was two guys killing each other for no reason. Gert Angle tried to cross himself on the ropes, missed, landed flat on the floor, damn near on his neck. Yeah. Uh, and then immediately had to come back and hit a top rope drop kick to the ladder, knocking Mr. Kennedy off it. Nearly killing uh, him. Nearly killing him. Both of them. Yeah. I was cringing. Suplexes on ladders. Moonsault onto a ladder. Mm-hmm. I mean, did you really Big think that he'd put Kurt Angle in a ladder match and he wouldn't kill himself? I mean, that would be a bigger story. The guy always works as hard as he can. Mm-hmm. And you, why not put him in a match involving chainsaws? Or a shark. Because you know he'd kill himself. Yeah. He would just keep working with that chainsaw until he was dead. Because he's Kurt Angle. Mm-hmm. So maybe they can do that next time. That might get ratings. I know this didn't. Maybe the quarter show, hour fell when this match was going next on. Show will, really? Yeah. Way to go, guys. <laughs> yes, they, they Good work. Them, they kill themselves for literally nothing. Uh, the, the at stake here, hanging above the ring in this ladder match, was the key to the cage. Which, again, if the only way to win, you know, if, 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 they, if it's such a big advantage to have this key, then why not just have the winner of the ladder match be the winner of the feud? And if it's not the big enough advantage, then what's the point of this? I'm just wondering, now that Ken Anderson has won the key, because he did win the key here, I mean, does he have to bring it to the match? Can he just leave Angle locked in? Yeah, can he just leave Angle locked in there? I don't know. I mean, does he have to bring the key? Why would he bring the key? Because then Kurt can get the key. I don't know. Or, 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 I don't even understand. I don't, no, I don't either. So, so he can bring the key into the, into the cage. Is Kurt Angle then not allowed to take it from him? I, I don't know. Or if he does, then what? Maybe he'll be disqualified. Maybe Angle wants to be locked in the cage with this guy. I guess. And, and if, if all of that is true, then why the fuck were they killing themselves with this key? So Ang- Anderson gets the key, and then he, he kind of collapses in the corner and stares at his newly won trophy, and they zoomed in on it. And it's a key tied to a piece of wood, which has some very sloppy wood burning on it that reads, and I quote, cage key. Well, it's very important because it could have been the key to the spider, for example. And all I could think was that this this cage key wood placard thing appeared to have been an eighth grade shop project. And I believe the child got a C minus. But it was very ugly. And again, they killed themselves for this. And you know, a few weeks back, we read an excerpt from Vince Russo's book. When it, mostly we talked about how uh, he wanted to let the critics know that they really did hurt him. But one of the things he moaned about there was how the wrestlers were largely ungrateful. Ungrateful! Yeah. Think of all Vince Russo has done for wrestlers. Think of what Vince Russo did for these men here. And yeah. having them kill each other for a low-rent cage key on a segment that turned viewers off and shortened their lives. Thanks, Vince! What a great guy you turned out to be. How could you not be grateful? He's full of shit. I was very sad watching this. Poor I interviewed Hogan about all the horrible things Bischoff had done. And up walked Bubba. Hogan wanted to know why he was running with the band. Bubba said it was more fun. Wasn't, wasn't having fun with Hulk, he said. So he, <laughs> he left and Jay Lethal walked up. And uh, apparently everybody was really upset about this. I, I, I tuned out. I, I saw this as Hornswoggle. I did not give a fuck. Hornswoggle does not use dead people for comedy. Apparently that's what happened. Yes, he was making... Jay Lethal was making jokes about the 1980s and the Mega Powers, and he told Vince, or told Vince, told Hulk that... Uh, something about how what happened to Liz is not our, not either of our fault. Mm-hmm. And uh, to be honest, I was not paying that much attention to what he said, only that they even brought Elizabeth into this comedy segment. Do they know she's dead? Maybe not. You would think Hulk Hogan would. Maybe not. Maybe they have no idea that she's dead. The man once claimed that... I think it was his ex story, wasn't he? Savage blamed Hulk for Savage and Liz's marriage breaking up because Liz came to Hulk's wife with her problems. So, they knew each other, clearly. So, yes. It just... Just tasteless, clueless. It, it is more evidence of cluelessness. They don't care about. They don't know or care about concussions. They don't know or care about Liz being dead. They care. It is impossible to say they don't know. They just don't I care. I disagree, Brian. Remember, we're talking about imbeciles, maybe even idiots. No, they're they're aware. They're just assholes. I need the drop from from uh, the Big Lebowski. What was that line? I have no idea actually which one you're talking about. The dude, the dude said it to uh, Walter. No, Walter, you're just an asshole. <laughs> yes, that was that was it. That was the line. That's the line. Because Walter's saying, "Am I wrong? Am I wrong?" And dude says, "No, Walter, you're just an asshole." No TNA. And Walter you're says, just "I'm not wrong." Assholes. Morgan did a promo with his TNA tag title belts, 
He's the one man tag champ. He declared now. himself the yes. He declared himself the reigning tag team champions. They said he'd face the winner of Machine Guns and Team 3D next week or this week, next week. Anyway, they had the match. This was the match that, of course, Chris Saban got killed in last time they wrestled. Okay, stop for a second. Didn't at the last pay per view wasn't there an Ultimate X match with the Machine Guns? I don't remember. Well, I looked it up, and there was an Ultimate X match with the Machine Guns. And the reason I bring this up is because at stake in that match was the number one contendership for the tag team titles. You are correct. So, yes, the Machine Guns, I actually remember that, which is actually bad because it made me furious during this match because they were the number one contenders, had been named so, never got their title shot unless I missed something. And uh, not only were they having a match here for the number one contendership, but they also apparently had one on something called Explosion, Mm -hmm. which I guess is another show they do. Yeah. That I... Pure Internet only or something. About three, about once every three years or so. Yeah. So I, I spent the entire time looking up the, the your newsletter review of that show to remind myself that, yes, indeed, the Machine Guns had earned a title shot, and now we're not getting it for no reason. Yeah. So, whatever. This place sucks. This, uh, I, that's what I wrote. This company sucks. So the crowd chanted for tables the entire match, and then when Bubba called for them to say, get the tables, they didn't do it. That made me laugh. And then it, none of it mattered because the band ran out and killed everyone for the DQ. Mm-hmm. So, got an interview with the band. They said they were running the show. Scott Hall was wearing a West Memphis Fire Department t-shirt. Yeah. I, <laughs> laundry day, I guess, in the Hall household. And uh, Nass said they were done carrying Hulk, and uh, and that was that. Yeah. And uh, whoop de doo we would leave. And they did the wolf back dance. In 2010. The Wolfpack dance is like, I don't know. You remember when, like, you were you were younger? A lot of you younger guys, maybe you'll understand, but when I was younger, I, I played, like, Super Mario Brothers, games like that, and you'd have a video game that was very, very primitive, but it would have some sort of musical theme that you'd think was really cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People still know the Super Mario Brothers theme, I guarantee you. Okay. Cliffy and Carlos probably but I mean, know it. But, I mean, you actually thought it was a good song. Like, if you could get it on CD and listen to it, you'd want to. Hmm. I would say that for The Legend of Zelda, for sure. So, regardless, then about ten years later, you look back at that song, and you're like, what a stupid fucking song. How did I ever think that song was any good? Welcome to the Wolfpack theme in 2010. No, I hated it then. But still, these guys are dancing to that song <laughs> in 2010. They are a bunch of... Senior citizens. I, they may as well play, like, Margaritaville. Something just completely out of God knows how long ago. And dance to that like it's still relevant and cool today. That, I think, actually may be cooler. How about the Macarena? Exactly! Okay. Exactly! Someone needs to steal that idea for impact. At least I'd laugh. These people actually, if they dance to the Macarena, it would be a giveaway that they realize how stupid it is. But... I think they actually think that Hall, Nash, these men are grandparents. <laughs> Kevin Nash is and Scott Hall, they're like late 40s, early 50s. If, if they're not grandparents, they're going to be soon. They're old fucking men dancing to the Wolfpack theme. I don't know. What fan... <laughs> Who could look at this and think, wow, what cool guys... <laughs> That's an excellent question. I don't have an answer. Pope did an interview. AJ, uh, or Desmond walked up and said that, I beat you last week. I should be facing AJ at the pay-per-view. Had a point. He did. Had an excellent point. And Pope was like, well, if you let's try it again tonight. If you beat me, you can have the spot. And jumping forward, they had a match and Pope beat him. So In like two minutes. Why Desmond beat Pope last week? I have absolutely fucking goddamn no idea. It- this whole charade has just lowered them both. It's now parody booking for the guy for the number challenging one for contender the title. who's getting a main event shot at your next pay per view. They're idiots. Doug Williams. Did this review is depressing me. Doug Williams. I this depressed me because Doug Williams coming out and actually Doug, yeah Doug's promo was awesome. Burying the acrobats, putting over the greatness of technical wrestling, demanding we refer to him as Douglas Williams, and then beating the fuck out of both of Generation Me. I loved this. I did too, actually. I, I, I want Doug Williams to cut promos in every show. They did a terrible rating. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Well, he is. You know, it's they. They have. 
I yeah. love the Doug Williams push. It's well, so great. It is great. He is he, Doug, Doug Williams is awesome. But he's been, you know, the, the quiet half of a tag team for the two years or whatever that he's been there. And so. now Shannon Moore is feuding with him and probably going to win his title. Yeah. That makes me want to... I don't know what that makes me want to do. Shannon did, in fact, call Doug boring. Yes. Never a good idea. Boring ass, he said. Never a good a idea. boring ass wrestler. To... <laughs> Because you should be doing flips, everyone. You should be, as Doug William noted, an acrobat or a trapeze artist. <laughs> Which is basically what they're doing with Ultimate X. It is. Let's be realistic. And, uh, yes, and, and it's always a good idea to tell your fans, this guy is boring. UFC has had boring champions. They didn't, they try not to broadcast it. And Team, Doug Williams is not boring. Team 3D is going to be facing the Wolf Pack in the worst match of the year next week. Yes, and uh, so not only are the machine guns not get their tag title shot that they fairly earned, but now they are have been shoved aside for this other program. So they're, they, they spiral down the ladder every week for nothing. So after Pope beat Desmond, we had AJ come out and, and uh, Abyss ran out. and Anyway, the heels beat up the <coughs> baby faces. Sorry for the cough right there. <coughs> Sorry, everybody. Heels beat up the baby faces and... Uh, Maybe it's this show that's killing me. Maybe some sort of noxious fume came out of my TV when I was watching this show and is is uh, is rendered me. You're infected. Yeah, you've got the TNA. Then we have time to reveal the contents of the lock boxes, or as I <laughs> typed my notes, and I don't think I meant this to be funny. Girls open their boxes. I when they said it was some sort of knockout lock box challenge, I was sure that chastity belts would be involved. I was positive. ODB referenced hers in the promo, too, so we're not the only ones. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I'm Actually, maybe I'm not stunned that Russo knows what a chastity belt is. May have run into it for years. So, basically, here, we had a game show segment to main event impact. Yeah. The, with the four girls were up there. They had their lock boxes. Borash was playing the part of uh, Alex Trebek, I guess. Pat Sajak is better. And uh, he asked for the lights to be brought down, which was funny because they were already down. So they tease the opening for, for maximum, I guess, suspense, as if we were supposed to care. And uh, they opened the first box. It was Velvet Sky. She got a contract. Great swerve. Yes. Let's Everyone, not have Velvet Sky strip here when we're trying to get well, ratings. We'll get to that. Let's give her a contract. Yeah. So they then moved on to Tara. They repeated what was left, her spider, her belt, or having to strip. He said she had never stood to her bra and panties before. I actually find that impossible to believe. She was in WWE for a long time, and she may not have been there at the peak of the of the Attitude Era when they were doing like fall matches of Mania, but she was there a long time. They did a lot, lot of bra and panties matches. I'm just saying. So, anywho, it didn't matter. She didn't get that. She didn't get the belt. She got her spider. She was ecstatic at first. Yeah. And then when he pointed out that she that meant she had lost her title despite winning, then she got sad. Mm-hmm. So, either the spider means more than the belt, or she's an idiot and forgot the rules. She's an idiot and forgot the rules okay. is the answer. There you go. So, then there were two boxes left. They opened them at the same time. Angelina opened her box and got the belt. She was the TNA Women's Champion. And that, of course, meant that Daphne had to strip. And that is a swerve. Of all yeah. the women in this company who are going to strip at the main event, people could in have, the off could have chance... Been ODB. I don't know. No, that would have been so Daphne much Daphne does less than nothing for me. Of all the people who stayed tuned through this show and sat through everything for the hopes of seeing a hot girl strip, they got Daphne. Yeah. That is a giant fuck you. Yeah, well... So, she well, didn't... Daphne, Daphne... As it turns out, she didn't do it. Well, I'm also saying that if you if you look at the quarter hours, Daphne is, in fact, one of the rare draws. You're kidding me. Ratings draws. Really? Well, there you go. So they and then what? they then they uh then they proceeded to not have her strip. Yeah. So it was a fuck you in the end. He he <laughs> she was going to walk away and Borash said, If you refuse, you are fired and I was screaming, Refuse That's a win win for me. I don't have to see you strip and I don't have to watch you wrestle either. Good times. So she got in the ring, she teased her for a while. I was fast forwarding honestly. Lacey appeared out of nowhere. She started to strip yeah. And then I wrote down, what a putrid show, putrid show, and then, oh, God, there's more. Tara and Angelina brawled to the ring. Lacey pranced around them. And then Velvet announced she was using her match 
her contract that she had just won for a match with Angelina next week in a leather and lace match, whatever the fuck that is. You know, I... I uh, it's so fucking blue. <clears throat> I'm not one of those people that... Uh, you know, there, there are people that think that Daphne is the hottest girl in wrestling. Oh, like, not. like That can't be true. They say that, you know, she's... You know, I'd rather be with uh, with uh, Daphne than Maurice. They say, and that is an example of a wrong opinion. Yes. Like you're you're telling me a lie. Now, with all that said, she's really not my type. This whatever she is, not my thing. But I would rather watch her strip for two straight hours than watch her have a two minute wrestling match. Just want to say that right here. She is a much much worse wrestler. Than she is a naked looking. Yeah. So anyway, to conclude, I'll just read the uh, final two lines here. And this was the end of the show. Holy shit, this show sucked. What more is there to say? I cannot argue. This was a, ter- a terrible, terrible program. I don't care all that much. Show sucks. Just have to do it again next <laughs> week. <laughs> just my own personal purgatory. My tuberculosis is <coughs> bothering me a hell of a lot more than you're going to sneeze on me, so I might die and escape impact. Wow! <sighs> to the back. Right, I want to talk about impact because I've been thinking about this for a while here. The show did a point seven nine this week. Is that good? Yeah. I mean, it's it's better than when they did the point six. That's true. It did a point eight this week. Mm-hmm. Not great. I mean, now, after it hit a point six, this is like a victory, which, think about that. Anyway, the point is that they had an hour unopposed, and in that unopposed hour, they did like a point nine in the hour unopposed. Monday night, before Raw, one hour unopposed, point eight. That really does suck. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about how I've mentioned this before, that they had a very loyal audience. Remember that TNA audience where we'd come on here every Thursday and we'd talk about what a goddamn horrible program Impact was, yet people continued to watch? You still do a 1.1. This 1.5 million people that watch this show every week through thick and thin. And there was plenty of thin. (laughs) Very little thin. In fact, there was years of thin. But these people just stuck with it. These people just could not be stopped. No matter what horrendous shit you put on this show, they still watch it every single week. Remember the barbed wire Christmas tree? I do. The Deuces Wild tournament? <laughs> All this other shit that we laugh about every week when we play Black that Rain's song? Mouse. These people watch the show through all of that. They used to have an X Division they pushed, and then they stopped pushing it. Samoa Joe, like, painted a penis on his face. You know, they... Just did all of this stupidity, and people still watch this show. I thought, this is the most loyal audience. If only I could tap into this audience, then I'd have that gold boat that I've been talking about for a while here. Because these people will put up with anything. You can insult these people. You can give them a horrendous product. They'll still watch your show every week. Well, they've lost some of those people. They've lost about a half a million of those people. A half a million of those people that we thought would never leave are gone. And I was thinking about the Impact show this week, and the first hour was really awful. Like, really bad. There was some ter- ter- just horrendous stuff on that show. But I don't care. I cannot fathom myself getting mad when I review this show. If I do, that's going to be pretty impressive. Because I just don't care. Mm-hmm. Maybe the show, maybe after all of the bullshit, all of the different time switches... The fact that it was another fresh start that failed yet again. I mean, how many of the new biggest nights in the history of TNA have we seen? Well, January 4th was like, this is a real one. You know, they always claim this is the biggest night of all time for TNA. January 4th, in a way, kind of was. The Monday Night Wars were starting again. And then March 8th even more so, because that's when they became permanent. But they fucked it all up again, as they always do. And maybe that was like the last straw for me. Maybe that was like my last my last ounce of caring left at that point. I just don't care anymore. I don't care that the show is bad. It doesn't bother me. I watch it. I make fun of it. I move on. 
I don't give a fuck. Anyway, the point is, I think that's what happened to that 500,000 people that have vanished. I think they finally just don't give a fuck anymore. They finally managed to drive those people off. So, with that said, let's look at this terrible show. I know people want me to get really mad when I review Impact and rant and rave, but I just don't think I can do it anymore. See, I watched... And there's no one to blame except TNA. Don't get mad at me for it. You just mad, get mad at them. They've burned me out. I watched this show after watching Raw, and Raw bored the hell out of me. I thought this show was actually much better. So This wasn't a bad show, especially the second half. There were, the there first was, half was really stupid. There was nitpicking we can do, but on the whole, A, a it was much more enjoyable to sit through, and B, it made me more excited for the TNA pay-per-view than I am for the WWE pay-per-view, which may, be the, it may literally be a first. You know, the only thing that I remember off the top of my head on this show is I was reading a book. I've been reading a lot of books lately. I was reading a book, and and uh, I'm not going to explain everything here. I'm just going to tell you what I saw. You know, all these books have, like, you know, there's, like, Ages. an insert in the middle that has pictures? Sure. Okay. Well, one of the pictures was, like, a child had drawn a picture of a car with, like, an elf in it wearing a Santa Claus hat, zooming down the road. A little elf with a Santa Claus hat in a mini car. It's all I can think about when I think of the security camera footage. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea why. Because it was part of the circus, I think. There, the, the security camera footage was... Well, it wasn't... I, I also laughed hysterically at this. It was so... Stupid. Should, do you should talk about that when we get to it, or do you want to talk about it now? We may as well talk about it now. Okay, for those of you the who missed the show. The whole thing was so stupid. For those of you who missed the show, Abyss got hit by a car. He got hit by a... You know, got, what they said was he got ran over by a car. Did they say run over? Which was even funnier, because actually he ran over the car when they yes. showed the security yes. camera footage. So first, first uh, they did it right before commercial. Abyss is on the ground. We don't know why. Then they came back and said Abyss has been hit by a car, and then immediately they cut to something else. They finally came back with security camera footage. So what happened was, well, Abyss got hit by a car, although as you noted, Abyss hit, hitting the car, the car got hit by Abyss, maybe a more accurate way of putting it. Yes. This is not, Abyss was not blindsided by this, nor was he hit from the front. This is virtually a head-on collision. <laughs> they were almost walking towards each other, or moving towards each other, and I believe Abyss may have been traveling faster. Yes. As devastating collisions go, this is low on the list. Now, I would rather have them do this than repeat what Jerry Lawler and Eddie Gilbert did 25 years ago. If you've never seen Eddie Gilbert hitting Jerry Lawler with a car, Jerry Lawler probably should have died. It was out of control and very dangerous. I would rather have them do this. But it still looked bad on television. <laughs> this, so Abyss is walking towards the car that's driving towards him. He throws himself on the hood and over the side. And uh, then the, the key that they were showing this was... Well, actually, to set up the, the security camera footage, first we just see that Abyss is down, and people are surrounding him. And Christy's there doing her CNN reporter uh, impersonation, basically, or maybe Fox News would be better, basically telling us that Abyss has been hit by a car. He's been run over by a car. Cuts commercial. Because, of course, a wrestler just got hit by a car. Who fucking cares? We've got a we have, we have products to plug. We've got some merch to plug. So they come back, and he's there, and she reveals that we have got security camera footage of what happened. So they play the footage, which is, in fact, a car ran over Abyss. I don't know why it was so funny that, like, it was so important for us to see this. You know what I mean? It would be like if, if uh, I'm, let me think of one of my classic analogies. Like a, a, a tree fell down on a car. Let's say no one was in it because we don't want anyone to get hurt, even in my analogies. Let's say that there was a news story of tree falls on car. And you turn on the news and there's a car with a tree on it. Right. And they announced that after this next break, we happen to have security cell phone footage of the tree falling on the car. And you wait through the entire commercial break, and they come back, and the footage airs, and it's the tree falling on the car. Exactly as you would have envisioned it in your mind. Not a thing, there was not a lightning strike, nothing. Just tree fall on car. That's what this was. I mean, do we really need to see it? 
No. I don't know why. I don't know why. It just... Well, the reason they had to show this for... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're here. They could have just said, we don't know what happened to Abyss. Something happened. He's down. He's hurt. But we've got security camera footage. We'll find out what happened. I see. Then you turn it on, and it's like, my God, he was hit by a car. That Thank been... God for the security camera footage. That would have been better. Yeah. But you see that the, the they didn't handle it correctly, but they had to show the security camera footage because, you see, the footage showed the identity of the driver. The driver. And uh, the driver, I can tell you, was a white person. We think. With sunglasses. Yeah, there no, could no, have been, definitely... There could have been a bright light shining on him. Well, it was the... Uh... He could have been wearing a white costume. It may have been Jack from Jack in the Box. <laughs> there was just a large white space where the head would be and sunglasses. Who would have worn one of those pointy caps? <laughs> Don't know. What maybe a coincidence. Taking, maybe taking the pointy cap off. I uh, My guess is that we were supposed to think this was Desmond Wolf. Well, they explain that later on in the show. Okay, yes. So, yeah, th- this... <laughs> This was all high comedy. It was, it was so, it was so immediately laughably bad. I didn't even hate it. I I enjoyed it for making me laugh so hard. I I hated it. Well, I laughed at it mostly. I laughed at it because they show the footage. They zoom in. There is a there is a human being, presumably. I actually said yesterday that it I was certain it was great. It may have been an alien. It may have been an, an alien life form. I don't know. I have no idea. It could have been that thing from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It actually looked remarkably like that thing, in fact. But anyway, there was there was there was a and I can't even say a hominid. I, I don't know. There was a there was a being capable of driving in this vehicle. So they zoom in on it. You can't see a goddamn thing. And Mike today starts going nuts about my God. It looks like well, I shouldn't say. We don't want to jump to conclusions. And I'm sitting there just thinking, I have no fucking idea who this is supposed to be. I rewound it multiple times. It was a person apparently wearing sunglasses. I I had no idea. I mean, it would be one thing if they zoomed in and Mike Tanay was like, I can't quite make out who it is. I can't quite make it out. I've got some ideas, but I'm not sure. Instead, he's acting like it's crystal clear and that we're fools to have not known who this was. <laughs> this was classic TNA right here. I'm just going to read my notes recapping this footage. Surveillance tape shows Abyss walking in front of a slow-moving car and rolling himself over the hood. This makes it look 100% like Abyss's fault. <laughs> well, maybe it was. <laughs> I amuse myself sometimes. So, yeah, that was the highlight of Impact. That was the highlight. That, when I look back on this episode in two years, I will forget everything except Abyss hitting a car. Well, I wouldn't even remember that. I'll remember it if you remind me that it yes. happened. Remember that time but, Abyss hit a car on Impact? If someone said, hey, Brian, remember what happened on the April 12th, 2010 Impact? Well, of course not. I will probably just say... No. Shit happened. <laughs> Which got a 95% chance of being correct. But if I tell you in two years, I say, remember when Abyss hit the car on Impact? I'll laugh at that. And 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 Jack from Jack in the Box was driving. You, you remember that part? I'll remember the elves driving the little, <laughs> the the little mini the car. car. Oh, Christ, what are we doing? Show open with Jarrett coming out, and, and uh, he yelled about how he was the founder of TNA. He came out to talk about how he was not here to talk. And then he talked. Then he talked. So, Can you imagine coming on this show every week and taking credit for founding this show? <laughs> this this is all my fault. I just can't even fathom it. So he, I always laughed at the concept of like being the TNA champion to 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 claim responsibility for this promotion. Yes, that takes balls. <laughs> so he said he was, as I said, he was not here to talk. He wanted to find Sting, so he immediately left the ring, went to go hunt Sting in the rafters. And then he announced, so, Sting, you want to play hide-and-seek? And right after he said this, he actually did play hide-and-seek with Sting. He hid. He saw Sting. He hid. Yes, he saw Sting coming around the corner, and he hid. Then he attacked him. They brawled up in the rafters for a long time. The crowd was chanting TNA. And Taz, playing the role of you and me, actually said, I'd love to see these guys make it towards the ring. Just sick of them brawling in the rafters already. Yeah. So they did eventually make their way to the ring. Sting actually took a bump on the ramp for a punch for this. That astounded me. I figured he'd be smarter. So after all this violence, they got the ring, and then Jeff wanted an answer. Yeah. Then he wanted to talk again. So the lights went out. They came back on. Sting had a bat. He beat him up. Jeff Hardy and RVD saved. And we never saw Sting again. Or Jeff. Sting is on one of the teams. We never saw him again. 
I don't yeah. even know why. He he had the uh, he beat him up with a bat. Why could he not continue later in the show? I don't know. So speaking of his team, he had a team flair promo. He said everyone was there, and I was like, no, Sting is not there. Sting is in the ring. Uh, you put it best in the newsletter when you said that this was a promo straight out of the 80s. Everyone said like a sentence or two, and uh, they all cackled, and they moved on. It was out of the 80s because Flair vowed to destroy Team Hogan and Hulkamania. Yes, in 2010, he yes. vowed to destroy Hulkamania. If, he, the only thing that was missing was him to say, once and for all. Sure. So he... He he ran it for a bit, and then he put on sunglasses as Beer Money cut a promo behind him, and Flair now has gone from being crazy to now he is old, crazy, and blind. You so, know, I, I didn't realize this till just now, but at the end of the show, Flair leaped out of the wheelchair to beat on the baby faces. Right. It would have been nice if they would have called attention to this astounding fact they, that they he can did. walk again. They, well, they didn't even have verbalized it, but they reacted, hey, look at Flair. He's... Been faking it this whole time. Huh. They sold it somehow. But yeah, this was... Wait a second. Yeah. He's been faking it the whole time? I guess that's what we're supposed to think. I assume. I assume God did not heal him. I mean, well, maybe not that God healed him, but that he finally he was able to walk over the past week, and this was the opportunity to jump out of the wheelchair. I have assumed, literally since the first moment I saw Flair in a wheelchair, he was faking it. Okay, the problem with that so. scenario is that there were many... Instances where the baby faces got hold of him in the wheelchair, and he responded by just sitting there. I do recall Hulk Hogan pushing him up the ramp. And yes. Why uh, did he not get out at that point? I don't to, know. Uh, I don't know. Well, this was stupid. I don't know. I didn't even realize it until just now how stupid this was. Well, at the time, it seemed like a perfectly fun promo. Didn't it? Didn't go too long. No, Everyone made was point. fine. Everyone to win. That was fine. When Desmond said that he was going to make the ring his own, and Chelsea says, "No, it's going to be mine." I can't even do a Chelsea impersonation. I can do Tiffany. I cannot do Chelsea. I cannot. I cannot be that See, boring. T- yeah, t- Tiffany has so much negative charisma. She has a charisma, and you can imitate her. Chelsea is just there. I mean, she. I don't know. I don't know. Even even when Tiffany is very obviously reading lines, there's high comedy to it. Oh uh, yes. This woman reads lines, and it's like you would be laughed out of a a high school play audition, and here you are on national television. And you know what? I don't want to. I don't. I don't like to to get on people's looks, as as we're well aware. And and really, you know, Chelsea's not a bad looking girl, but is she really so hot? You know what I mean? She the, is she really the best Desmond Wolf can do? I mean, it would be one thing if like. Helen of Troy came available, and she couldn't read a line. But my God, every time she was on TV, you fell over in your chair. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This girl is not even the best-looking girl on this show. No. She may not be above average on the show. Yet, there... Why? Why is she there? She can't deliver a line, and she's not a stunner, so I'm not certain why they hired her. Like, they signed her to a contract, Vince. Yeah, I, I know, I know. You couldn't go... Of all couldn't, the things to question TNA about over the past eight years, this is the one that's stuck on you? Yeah, hiring practices. You're stuck on? Yeah. You, right, well, you, you, you could go. walk through Universal Studios and probably find a hundred girls better looking than her on any given day that could deliver a better line and would probably work for a hundred bucks a show. And instead, for some reason, I, I, I don't know. This This one is just a complete enigma to me. We had the Team 3D and Jesse Neal against Hall, Nash, and Waltman Street Fight, where they hit each other with shit for, like, five straight minutes. And by they, I mean the baby faces hit the heels. Yes, this is Vince versus Brett all over again. Yeah. Well, at least this time they did not lose the crowd. And there was heat. There was a lot of heat. And then finally, um, Bubba went up top. And, I mean, think about this, everyone. They had laid waste to the heels for five straight minutes. With weapons. With weapons. As my notes read, good guys lay complete waste to their foes using every weapon on earth. So Bubba goes to finish off X-Pac, and who should run down but Bubba the Love Sponge? He distracts Bubba Ray, X-Pac with the X-Factor through a table. Bubba is pinned. Astounding. He also did the What's Up drop in 2010. Well, yeah, they'll do that forever. They will do that forever. And also, 
and this isn't actually even a criticism, just I was kind of stunned. These six men were all brawling in the ring, and who's named at the crowd chant but Jesse Neals. Good. Hey, he's over. Great. I was just surprised. And then Eric Young ran out, and we're getting Kevin Nash and Eric Young in a singles match in a cage at the pay-per-view. Who <laughs> thought that match would be a good idea? Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer. When I said I was excited for the pay-per-view, this is not the match I was thinking of. I would nearly bet a million dollars this match will not be good. <laughs> It has very, very low odds. I, I This is a case of foresight being 2020. Yeah. You look back on this show in a week, and, and I will be correct that that match is going to be bad. Because if I were in charge, I would not put a bad match together. It would be one thing if it were two guys people wanted to pay to see. Yeah. But a single person? Is a single person paying for Kevin Nash versus Eric Young? The answer is no. And it's going to be a bad match on top of that. So why would you put it together? I wouldn't. But uh, Eric threatened Nash by saying that he would get righteous in this match. Righteous? He said, he said I'm going to get righteous. And his music played. And this is a stupid line. Sean Waltman reacted like it was a stupid line, which was funny. But the first time I've taken a good close look at Sean Waltman in HD, he looks old. Well, And he's standing to Kevin Nash. Rode his own him. He has had a rough life. Hogan in an interview and saw Eric talking to Flair. And then he confronted him and said that we need to uh, chit-chat about this in the office. I just like that. The, the, this happens a lot with it, with this group, but Hogan and Bischoff are like junior high girls. They're Hulk, divas. Oh, yes. Hulk saw Eric talking to someone who he's jealous of, and now he's giving him the cold shoulder. Yeah. We had Shannon Moore versus Kazarian, who was introduced as hailing from Southern California, <laughs> which is a very large area. They had a really good match. It was fun. The uh, Kazarian was the a very subtle heel. Uh, he, he got the heat. Shannon made a big comeback. Looked great making his comeback. Douglas Williams was on commentary, burying them for their acrobatics and stuff. Shannon was doing his comeback. He did a flip off the rope on the floor. And Douglas dubbed it foolhardy. And then Kaz did something where Shannon was on his shoulders and Kaz bridged back for a pinfall and didn't work. And Douglas said he could have just done a small package or a backslide and then said, oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> he also said the crowd was dead on their feet, which is such a blatant lie, he cannot say it with a straight face. Yes. So, when we time limit draw, the crowd booed, they demanded a finish, they didn't get one, so the wrestlers shook hands. Douglas made fun of them for kissing and making up. He vowed to put an end to this nonsense of lockdown, and then they went to chase him away to the back. This segment was great. Douglas Williams is my favorite thing on this show. He is really awesome. It, it, is, it is stunning how long he was just the silent wrestler on the show, whereas, in fact, he's a great wrestler and a great talker. If so. he loses the belt at the pay-per-view, I'm going to be so sad. Dude, Shannon Moore. This should just go on for years. Yes. Or at least several months. But, uh, yeah, this, this segment was just an absolute home run. And it was followed by a Velvet Sky promo. Her tits did a promo. It's really the only way to describe it. They were enormous. And Good. She then did the stupidest... It's a good thing she had giant breasts, because this was just the stupidest fucking promo, leading to the stupidest fucking match. Basically, she has won the right to have any match she wants at any time. Right. She's chosen a match with Angelina, the women's champion. So she comes on the air, and she announces that, I've decided the belt's not going to be on the line. Hmm. Why is that? Because you see, on Sunday... It is going to be Velvet and Madison versus Tara and Angelina with whoever getting the pin winning a title. Meaning if, if Velvet and Madison pin Tara and Angelina, I guess whoever gets the pin gets the women's title. And if Tara and Angelina pin one of the other two, they win the tag titles or something. Regardless. The point being, point being, why didn't you just put the fucking title on the line in this match? Why wouldn't you want... Two chances to win the title. You stupid woman. <laughs> why would why would you, I mean, you know, why would you not want two chances? She then goes out for the match. We'll just cut to the chase here. And she changes the rules again. It's no longer a leather and lace match. It's now a match where Angelina's handcuffed, and she gets to beat on her until Angelina says, I quit. Title's still not on the line. Yes. Your fucking opponent has been handcuffed 
And you do not put the title on the line. So she beats crap out of her for a long time. Angelina refuses to quit. The other two beautiful people run down. Tara makes a save. The match, match ended. ends without a finish. Yes. The yeah. only way to win, everyone. The only way to win is to say I quit. No finish. Ah, that was no good. It sucked. They're, 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 that's the biggest thing that's bad about it, but... The point Velvet announced, she announced, I, I, didn't, I didn't get her exact words, but she basically said, I'm going to handcuff you and I'm going to whip your ass. So the heel has just told the baby face, I'm going to handcuff you and torture you. And Taz's response was, and this is a quote, works for me. <laughs> he does not care. No. At all. So, yes, and, and again, why would Velvet not want the title line here? And then later... When, when uh, Angelina would not quit, Velvet threatened her by saying, I guess I'll just have to strip you naked. You'll be shocked, but the crowd did not boo. No. These people don't understand how to make faces and heels. At all. I don't know if I've ever mentioned that before. And it ended with Tara making the save, but then refusing to shake Angelina's hand. So, yes, we are going to get the wacky tag champs who hate each other again. Yeah. So, yeah, that was no bias. I agree. Russo just has to have a bunch of, of ideas on cards, and he shuffles them and... There's only about four of them. Yeah. Tag champs, tag champs who hate each other. Pull. <laughs> Seeing objects on a pull. Gauntlet match. <laughs> the, the gauntlet match. Uh, no holds barred fight that has a wacky name. And, right. And the ring is disguised. And no finish. And no finish. I don't know. That's all I can think of. Probably sure there's more. Hogan so. and Eric bitched backstage, <clears throat> and uh, Eric told him that, uh, you know, you can trust me, which, of course, is a lie. And then uh, Jay Lethal walked in and wanted to team up with Hogan against the band, and Hogan said, find my tights, maybe we'll do it after the paper. He actually called him his banana hammock. That's what he said. Yeah. He also, because his cock's big. Sure. He also said, when Lethal said was mad about the band, he said, they didn't play Be a Man, did they? <laughs> it's actually funny. <laughs> Hogan and Lethal are a great team. I'd be fine with watching them do stuff every week. We had an awesome interview with Abyss and the Pope. I cried tears of joy. This was so great. And uh, it, it was a uh, Pope cut his usual great promo. And I love the post promos. And this is one of them. And Abyss totally upstaged him. Yes, he said he could not be stopped, and told Desmond Wolf to bring a rocket launcher <laughs> or a bazooka. Yeah, great. Which was funny because he. A, he brought a rental car and actually did the deed. <laughs> that was kind of sad. <laughs> At least there could have been a bazooka on top of the car or something. <laughs> or clubbed him with a bazooka. There was, there was also here an Angelina promo where she said she did not come to TNA to parade around in her underwear like a lady of the night. That's what she said. I howled with laughter. Yeah. Did you forget the first four years you were here? She's serious wrestler now. Yeah. And so, her argument with, with uh, Tara... One of those one of those classic moments where it should not have aired. Because yeah. when it was over, you hated both of them. <laughs> well, you, you hated them. They, they did not, I, I do not think they teased a fight. They teased a hate fuck. They teased violent, angry lesbian sex. Uh, Morgan and we Red, didn't get that either. Morgan and Red against the machine guns. Lowest rated segment on the show, .65. Matt Morgan is the, uh, the fighting baby face who is a heel with his diminutive partner. Against the guys they never promote, it just didn't work. Match was fine. I, I actually Red and the Machine Guns were awesome. When Morgan cut his promo and announced he had made, made me pick a partner or someone picking this guy, and Red walked in, I thought you know that could be a really fun team because Red can do the entire match. Hot tag Morgan, he can come in and throw the small men around. That could be fun. And you know what? It was a fun team, but I knew from the start it was doomed mm-hmm. because everything in TNA must turn to shit. And so after they had their fun match, and they won, Morgan killed his partner, and the team is dead. Jeff Hardy and Robert Roode. This is a pretty good little match. It uh, We had an, a run-in by James Storm, right in front of the ref. No DQ, of course. That's in the Russo playbook as well. So Jeff hit the senton. He got the pin, I think. I don't really know what happened there at the pin, but the bell rang, and Hardy was given the... Uh, the win. And then they, of course, had Storm get in the ring and blow a fireball in Hardy's eyes, which they edited off the live show and told us we had to go on the internet to see. 
Really? It's it's on the internet, everyone. They didn't seem to plug the website. Huh? They didn't plug TV. Well, they did. It's just you didn't air the fireball on TV. We have to go to the website. In fact, let's see how many people went to the website. You continue. So yeah, they had to get a match, and uh, Jeff was burned, and then RVD tried to save, but he got beat up too. It was overkill having a guy get hit by a car and another guy get burned by a fireball on the same show. But at least, especially since they're both wrestling. In on the pay per view in a week. Yeah. Yes. But uh at least it was all they were both small parts of a larger angle. And Storm with the beer bottle. Oh, that's trademark storm. Here is that's a beer money incorporated is all about. Oh my god! He blew a fireball right in the face of Jeff Hart. That's that, that can't be beer. That, that's some type of flammable liquid. What the hell was that? What the hell was that? Oh my god. That was, it was obviously well, that was quite spectacular. That's what that was. Did it? Sure. And they didn't put it on television. That was a won't... gigantic. It looked like the Death Star exploded. I all just... in Jeff's face. Well, I it, did. Maybe Spike told them, "No, you can't hear this." I don't know. But um, eighty-seven thousand people watched it. I just love out of the one point one million that could have seen it <laughs> if you would have fucking put it on TV. I just love. That Mike Tanay has just watched, as you said, the Death Star has exploded into a man's face and lit him on fire. And Mike Tanay's response is, that can't be beer. Yeah. You don't say. Can't be beer. That, that's the real outrage, is that James Storm was carrying a beer bottle around that does not have beer in it. Never mind the immolation that has just occurred in the ring. Wow, there you go. How exciting. All right, move on. We had a Ken Anderson, Kurt Angle hype video. It was really long. I don't know. Was this any good? I, I watched the whole thing. Which match? Anderson and Angle. Um, I it was all right, but again, I, I don't know why we'd want to see it again. I watched the whole thing. And I I'm just actually had... distracted by the TNA Wrestling YouTube page. I'm going to see if there's any good stuff on here. There might be. I I watched this entire hype video, and I was not moved one way or another. So, I don't know. Maybe people, other people care about this, but we've seen it all. We had the Pope cutting a promo. His, he was set for a tag team match with Abyss later tonight, but of course Abyss was run over by a car. So he was a serious Pope here. He was talking about saying prayers for Abyss, and he had a job to do, and he was going to go out and fight two-on-one. When Jay Lethal come up, came up and cut a Macho Man promo, he said he would be the post partner, and they vowed to take on Rick Martel and somebody else. So the main event then had been changed to AJ and Desmond versus Pope and Lethal. So Pope makes his entrance, and they cut backstage to where Beer Money is beating up Jay Lethal, and they beat him up for like an hour. Yeah. And Pope just stayed in the ring. Look at the monitor saying, ah! Uh-oh! My partner's being killed. Oh, wait. So, a long time went by until finally they broke a bottle over his head. So now he was out. So now it was Pope in a handicap match against AJ and Desmond. Except then, as Desmond was on the ramp, Hogan whacked him with a chair, took him out. So now it was AJ versus Pope, and then Flair got out of the wheelchair for a DQ in like two minutes. And uh, Beer Money ran down. They all beat up Pope. James Storm should keep his shirt on more often. It's a better, uh, it's a better go-home show than usual, by uh, TNA standards, of course. I am excited for the lethal lockdown match. Yeah? Why? Because the baby faces got their asses kicked here and now have something to come back from. How many cages is it? Oh, the, all, the, the whole show is in cage matches. But is it double cage, single cage? You've seen this match before. I know, but it would have been nice if they might have mentioned oh. what lethal lockdown is. No, they've never done that. It I don't think a single fucking time no, they've, they've explained what a lethal lockdown match you is. You and I know that it's war games with a roof with weapons. I guess it doesn't matter since they've only got 1.1 million viewers. But the idea of going on Mondays was to vastly increase your audience, mm-hmm. and it would be nice to tell the new fucking people what your lethal lockdown match is all about. I hope that they they, uh, they just bring back King of the Mountain and don't bother to explain the rules. Oh, Christ. That'll be a good one. I want to listen to this. We're going we're gonna to wait till the end to play the song, because I've got to... Uh, I don't know if I'll play the whole thing, but as everybody's well aware, Don West is now in charge of the TNA Live Event Center. I've never watched one, but I want to uh, hear some of this, so let's give it a shot. 
Don West here at the TNA Live event. Speaking Center, of where we tell you where we've been and we tell you where we're going. Folks, we just got back from an incredible trip in Ozark, Alabama, Columbus, Georgia. Love meeting everybody there. Also, a lot of the big stars. Jeff Jarrett, the beautiful people. Jeremy Borash, Team 3D. Jerry Borash. Fort Benning. We were able to spend a lot of time with the soldiers and let them know how much we appreciate everything that they do for us. It really is the rewarding parts of these trips. Folks, we got a huge trip coming up. I'm talking April the 8th, the 9th, and the 10th. Folks, Oops. we're going to be in Corbin, Kentucky. Then we're going to Pikeville, Kentucky on Friday night. And on Saturday, it's Huntington, West Virginia. Folks, this is going to be an incredible loop of shows, and you will... Excuse me, I have hot news. Whoa, JB. I have hot news. Jimmy Borat. Excuse me to interrupt the show, but I have hot news. I was told to bring this in here to you right away and have you read it on the air. I don't even know what it says. Well, folks, let's... About this Corbin show. All right. This Pikeville show. Okay, uh, Corbin Pikeville with Huntington. Uh... Oh, no. Holy crap. <laughs> oh, I don't know what that means for you. Folks, this just in late breaking right, news. Gonna, gonna, is this for real? Is this a rib on me? It's not a rib on me. Is this real? No, it's real. Oh my gosh. Oh, you've got to come see this. I know. I know. It is just in the controversial one. Eric Bischoff is going to be at the shows in Corbin, in Pikeville, in Huntington. Now, I don't know what that's going to mean specifically. Why is he coming, Don? Well, obviously he's. He's going to keep his eye on you. He's heard about all the shenanigans that JB does on these house shows. Oh, all I can tell you is this. When he comes, that means there's going to be unbelievable chaos and controversy. I don't know what's going to happen, but you don't want to miss it. You want to be a part of there because if Eric Bischoff's going to show up, fireworks are going to go off. Unbelievable shows that just got better. And as always, folks, don't forget, April the 17th. April the 17th, it is fan interaction, and then April the 18th, it's lockdown. You don't want to miss both those incredible events in St. Louis. Always fan interaction, one of the greatest days in it's our lives. a shot of Chris Daniels is no longer and I and everybody get to meet all the superstars, all the wrestlers. And don't forget to sign up for that main event package where Sting, Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, all in the same room. And all the benefits that go with that are incredible. And then, of course, uh, lockdown on the following Sunday. Jobs. You don't want to miss it. As always, Sad go to me. the website Gross. where you find out when tickets go on sale. If we have tickets on sale for Lake Charles, Louisiana, Hometown Houston, of Buddy Wayne. Texas, and Beaumont, Texas. Always, there's only one way to experience TNA, and that's live. The man is this astounded. This TNA it's wrestling amazing, hobby really. is the sexiest cyber knockout on the web. SoCal Val. What is this? See her every Monday night live on TNAWrestling.com. <laughs> she's, she's posing in the rain. And don't and forget about now him. there's Jerry Warren. Hosted by SoCal Val. He is now the dry hump in your Is it happening in TNA Wrestling? It's happening here first. Log on to ShopTNA.com. What am I listening to all of this for? <laughs> Because it's better than listening to us. Wow! Yeah, Don West is awesome. Don West is quite great. That yes. was better than Impact. Yeah. To the back! We're here to run down the TNA lockdown pay-per-view. And what this was, was a horrendously booked, ridiculously stupid pay-per-view with two great matches in the middle of it. It was actually, it was astounding how matches so good could have been in the middle of such an awful show. I mean, until the Kurt Angle match, this was one of the worst shows ever. Just preposterous. Then we have the Kurt Angle match, which, as great as it was, involved one of the stupidest things I've seen in years. We'll get to that later. We had the AJ versus Pope match, which was a great world title match until the crappy finish. And then we had Lethal Lockdown, which... <laughs> I wrote in the update today, I wrote in the update today that unless they do something stupid, like give the guys, the baby faces, the man advantage, it's probably going to be a really good match. It's war games, everybody. How do you screw this up? How do you screw this up? There's exactly one way to screw up a war games match. You give the baby faces the advantage. So, what did they do? 
Sure as shit, they gave the baby faces the advantage. It fucked up the match. It resulted in the baby faces looking like complete idiots. Complete idiots. And then we had a finish where essentially Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff won the match. Yes, the finish was Hulk Hogan up and down. The finish was Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. Defe- uh, yes, Hogan and Bischoff defeating Ric Flair in the Ethel Lockdown. None of whom were in the match. <sighs> Let's talk about this show. All right. It was every bit as stupid as it sounds. It actually started off stupid literally before any of the matches began. Taz made some announcements, Taz and Tanae. First of all, Doug Williams was off the show due to a volcano. Could not fly out of Europe. Therefore, he was being stripped of the title. He was no longer the best wrestler in the X Division because there was a volcano going on. Yeah. Yes. So it was so important that they have a title match on the show that they were at... In, in the process of having a title match on the show, they devalued the very title they were fighting for. You know what's even dumber than that? What's that? I'm going to tell you what's even dumber than that. And that's dumb. And even even Taz, playing the role of Brian and Vinny, noted how stupid that was later on in the show. Let me tell you what is even dumber than the fact that they stripped the guy of the title because a volcano erupted. I presume that Doug Williams was supposed to lose the title on this show. As stupid as the booking of the show is, they cannot help but stick to their bad booking. This has gone on for well over a year now. They do long-term bad booking. Yes. All of this shitty, stupid, nonsensical booking that you see on the show every week is thought out and booked long in advance. And they will not alter from those plans. No. They they could not wait until Doug Williams returned to put the title on Kazarian. My God, the plans were for Kazarian to win the title on this show, so we're sticking to it. Even if that means a man is being stripped of the title because of a volcanic eruption. An act of God. It just astounds me. So there were more announcements. Yeah. That was the one that made TNA look the most stupid. We also learned that Six Pack had... And this is a direct quote. No showed. Yeah. Well, that's what he did. I'm sure. He, he decided he didn't want to do a job. <laughs> and it was explained that this was six Pac being six Pac. Sean Waltman, in the year 2010, was unwilling to do a job. Because you know he has so many job opportunities he in this so business. He so many other options in front of him, yes. Yeah, so he didn't show up. So that was, that was not their fault on this day, although it does make the decision to hire him a few months ago look stupid. One I advocated, by the way. You know what? You know what's my new pet peeve. I'm, I have no idea. I'll there are you, many to choose from on this show. Oh man, it, they're 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 really. I, I I maybe this has always been my pet peeve, but after Strike Force last night, and and now this show with with what happened with Waltman, my new pet peeve is people with absolutely no foresight. It's one thing if you make a mistake based on. A lack of history to learn from. It's one thing if, if if there's if there's nothing to learn from in the past. You're trying something for the first time and a mistake is made. It's one thing. It's one thing if if you you see something happen and you go, man, you know, I didn't expect that to happen. I really I really didn't think that that was was likely to occur. That's one thing. Strike force. I mean, have I not been ranting about this for weeks now? How stupid it is to have a two-hour block. You're at the mercy of CBS. They can cancel you at any time. You're, you're teetering on the brink of cancellation as it is. They give you two hours. They tell you, we want this show over in two hours. Does it really take a genius to realize you shouldn't book... Three title fights on your show? Apparently. Now, obviously, all of those fights could have gone 45 minutes. But that doesn't matter. Because they all also could have gone five rounds. Which they did! You went 45 minutes past the top of the hour. Hello? No shit that can happen. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to TNA. 
This is not... Boy, in hindsight, they probably shouldn't have brought in Sean Waltman in 2010. This is foresight. It was known going in that it was probably a bad idea to hire Sean Waltman and Scott Hall. They did it anyway. And then Sean Waltman no-showed a pay-per-view. Do you think I have even the slightest bit of, of uh, sympathy for these fucktards? No. No. They're absolute morons. Thank God Kurt Angle didn't die during the show. But you know what? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know what? He could have. Yes. And if he would have, everybody would have been so sad. How many times have I given this speech? Everybody in TNA would have been so sad that Kurt Angle killed himself. We would have had a fucking graphic tomorrow. We would have had a big Kurt Angle tribute show. His wife would have been trotted out on TV to cry. His children would have cried. They would have talked about his Olympic gold medal and what a hero he was. Meanwhile, no shit he could have died. He's a 40-something-year-old man, and you had him do a moonsault off the top of a fucking cage. You couldn't have seen this coming if he would have died. Jeff Hardy... On top of a fucking cage. A ladder on top of a cage. He climbed. Thank God he didn't die. But you know what? If he would have, everybody would have been so sad. This is not This is not like you throw somebody into the ropes and they hit the ropes and they break their neck and die. They hit the ropes. Everybody's there every single day. In TNA, people are constantly being put in a situation where they could die. And, are, and they're going to be shocked someday when it happens. They're going to be shocked someday when someone gets badly injured. Boy, we never saw that one coming because you're fucking morons. God, this just made me so mad. The last two days have just been filled with such idiots, such complete idiots. So we had RVD and James Storm for the man advantage. Actually, I'm not done with the pre-match pre-show oh, stupidity. So they announced that Doug Williams is volcanoed out. They announced that Sean Waltman is just not there. And they made it clear that Sean Holman was really just not there, and then they immediately slipped into storyline mode and said Eric Bischoff has not arrived yet. In yeah. fact, in fact, they said there was a call time for wrestlers. They said it was 1 p.m. or something when they had to be at the building, and if they were not there, they were basically screwed. And it was made clear, then immediately in the very next sentence, made clear Eric Bischoff had also missed this call time, and no one cared. Yeah. So, RVD versus James Storm. You know, I wonder if when this show was over, they're like, I wonder why, I wonder why the main event didn't get over. Well, maybe because he gave the baby faces the man advantage. The baby faces got the man advantage in this battle as RVD beat James Storm. They had a good match. I gave it three and a quarter stars. I really enjoyed the match. Mm -hmm. Why do you give the baby faces the man advantage? I don't even care anymore. Because of the return. I've done all my ranting. There it is. Yes, the, the all steel cage match show opened with what else but ringside brawling outside of the but cage. That's right. That's right. The very first thing they did in the all cage match show was they brawled out. Outside the cage, and around the cage, and all over the ringside area, before they finally got into the cage. So early in this match, before the heat, Rob, uh, I think he hit in the stairs or hit the cage, but he ended up bleeding pretty good. So it was not time for the heat yet. So do you call an audible? Do you say, okay, I'm going to start something immediately. Steam storm, work over my face. No, Rob just kept doing his moves until their planned spot. Yeah. God forbid the ad lib. So they got the heat, and it was, by the end, it was a good match. I went three stars. But yes, the, between the crowd, the, the floor brawling in the cage match, the uh, <laughs> the Rob getting cut open, but still not going to the heat yet. Oh, there's one more stupid thing. James Storm at one point hit a low blow. He, he spat beer in Rob's face and hit a ro low blow. But before doing this, in the steel cage match, he had to distract the referee. Yeah. Was that referee going to disqualify him? Actually, yes. Did he do this last year? Because if you'll recall, Vince Russo, he actually went on his Facebook or whatever and explained it. That's right. Who said you can't have a DQ in a cage match? Well, we'll get back to this rant later. And the answer to that is, I do. So in, I say you can't have a DQ in a cage match. I just think it's astounding that if you actually watch TNA with any regularity, there don't appear to be any DQs in normal matches. No. But you can get DQ'd in a cage match. <laughs> yes, maybe the, the, the rules are stricter in a cage match. I guess. They're more restrictive. So, yes, despite all the stupidity, they had a good match. 
Chris, uh, Chris interviewed Hogan, who did a weird fucking promo, where he just basically said that... He well, said, actually, first he said, it's okay to hit a man over the head with a fire extinguisher, but it's not okay to run him down with your car. He explained that burning someone's head off, that's his exact words, or running them over with a car, quote, just doesn't work. But a fire extinguisher to the head, that's fine. <laughs> do not do not tell Jim Cornette this, everybody, or there will be trouble. So they did this deal, and he basically said that if if... If Team Flair wins tonight, I may as well just leave. <laughs> and I thought that was kayfabe for Team Flair's winning tonight, and I'm getting the fuck out of this place while I, I still can. I actually did, too. I thought he had, he had uh, seen the... Uh, the, the what's, this, what's the word I'm looking for? The writing on the wall. He had seen the writing on the wall and was getting out of there. But, yes, it was a very wacky... The writing on the wall was written in 2005. It's oh. called Death of WCW. Right. How he is unaware of this writing until right now, I have no idea. Okay, do you really think he's read the book? It doesn't matter. He did live this the life. This is not writing on the wall. This <laughs> is not like, huh, you know, I had seen that till I... Uh, Motor City Machine Guns against Homicide and Brian Kendrick. They said that whoever got out of the cage would take Doug Williams' spot. They went, like, two minutes, maybe three... It was good while it lasted, and Homicide and Kendrick were working together until Homicide just ran for his life and escaped and screwed Kendrick. They did a bunch of moves. Kendrick was kicked in the cage, was also bleeding a minute in. So this, I think this, actually, this cage was composed of razor wire. It was like an actual war zone. And once again, and this is like the fourth time this has happened, the machine guns lost to a team that could not get along. Yeah. They always get buried, and yeah. this company wonders why. Kevin Nash and Eric Young... This was better than I expected. It was thankfully also about three minutes. Eric bumped all over the place, and then Nash powerbombed him. One, two, three. <laughs> Eric looked like a complete and utter jobber, and Nash then cut a promo saying that he was going to take Xbox place in the match. For the second time in three matches in the show, we had a referee distraction leading to a low blow. Yes. Are there no Asians in TNA? There are. They're idiots. I see. Uh, I was, in fact, as we'll explain in the very next match... Madison and Velvet against Tara and Angelina in a match where all the titles were on the line. So if Tara or Angelina got a pin, they won the tag titles and would hate each other. Or if Madison or Velvet pinned either one of the other two, champion or not, they would win the women's title. So, with all that said, they had a, a preposterously booked match. They come out, they get the heat on Tara, I guess. So, Tara starts to make a comeback, but like your typical idiot babyface, won't make a tag. So, Angelina ends up, uh, or no, 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 she wouldn't get a tag, she goes up top, she misses a moonsault. Mm -hmm. Then she makes a tag. And, and, and she missed the moonsault, and then they did a double down, and then the actual hot tag. Yeah. And there was no heat for Angelina's comeback. Why? I wonder why. Why? why? How could that be? So, Tara had been selling for God knows how long. She makes a tag. Angelina runs wild for about 20 seconds, and Tara immediately tags back in, stops selling instantly. They began doing some moves. The ref was distracted for the third time in four matches, because as noted, you could have a DQ in a cage match in TNA. So suddenly, Lacey Von Erich just opens the door <laughs> and runs in. She is not... Is this there's a, a no knob? key, there's no, there's no lock, there's no chain. She just lifts, lifts the latch, latch pulls and it goes open, in. and comes in. This may have been the smartest thing she's ever done, actually. She goes in there, hits Tara with the belt, leaves, and the ref turns around, and Madison Rain pins Tara to become the women's champion. Thank God there's a cage here, by the way. <laughs> yes. For those of you who maybe you've not studied wrestling history, the idea of the cage is not to have something there that guys can throw each other into. No. The idea of the seal cage is to prevent outside interference. No, it's actually, there's six words. No one in, no one out. Yes. That's it. Yes. The cage is there so that nobody can get into it, and the cage is there so that no one can get out of it. Yes. You don't just have a fucking door that opens randomly. There wasn't even a lock on this door. Oh. So Taz, ordinarily he plays the role of Brian Vinny pointing out the stupidity. Here he was the company man. He was appalled that Angelina would lose her women's title without even being pinned. Yeah. Never mind that she won the belt in a box. Like I said, the coder ring at the bottom of Lucky Charms or something. This was the second straight knockout title change where the champion did not get beaten. Although, although, Lance... 
emailed me during the show. He was reading the front page play-by-play. I guarantee he was probably the only person on the entire earth to recognize this. And I guarantee that TNA didn't think about this, but Madison pinning Tara was actually her pinning the rightful champion. Because Tara did lose the belt in a box. Yes. So... So there you go, everybody. It all works out in the end. His booking was to say. so goddamn complex that it went over everyone's head but Lance. You know, it would have been nice if the announcers would have made mention of that, for example, but of course no, they did not. It's, it's irrelevant to them. Because, because, again, Taz is appalled that Angelina lost her title unfairly. That was the only issue that mattered. And um, I wanted to note that I wrote this down here at this point with an hour left in the show. This may have been the worst booked match I ever saw. I may rescind that comment by the end of this. So that after all that... Tara turned heel on Angelina. Oh, yeah, I forgot. And we're supposed to care. No, I didn't care. I don't. I don't care. Flair's team did a promo. At least Sting was there for once. (laughs) He ranted and raved. Everyone loved him. And then AJ did a promo and said he'd win. No one gives it about AJ. Desmond Wolf got himself a robe, a fancy robe to stand out and not be so bland. Of course, it's gray. (laughs) Of course. He's a gray wolf. (laughs) I guess so. Homicide, Kazarian, and Shannon for the vacant X title. Dave said this was a really good match. I'm not quite sure if he was watching the same match I was. I gave it a star and a quarter. I, I went one star. I, I thought about giving it one star, but I couldn't go as far as to say it was a bad match. I just thought severely below average. They it did a million good. moves. Yes. This was the kind of match where everybody always bitches about the fans and what they say and what they do. This was one of those times where they chanted, this is awesome, and I, I actually was offended. Like, I was offended that they had the temerity to chant that for this match. Everybody did some moves. Everybody bought some moves. Everybody messed up spots, and then Kazarian won. This was now, for historical purposes, the second TNA match in a row on this pay-per-view where there was a title change that had absolutely nothing to do with the champion. That's true. Yeah, that is true. So I was going to summarize this match. Almost this is Taz's almost exact words. Kazarian and Shannon Moore had a plan to double team Homicide in the beginning of this match. Now Taz did not mention this, but Homicide is a heel. I thought, and Kazarian and Shannon Moore were baby faces. But aside from that, this is a direct quote from Taz. Then it just fell apart, and everybody went at it. Yeah, one star. Holland Nash actually we had a Pope promo, which is awesome. Pope is great. Hall and Nash against they Team 3 announced, They also announced that they were stripping the title from Doug Williams because he was stuck in Europe. They mentioned that the belt itself was also stuck in Europe. Yeah. So the title is so important, they have to award it to someone, even though it's not even there. Yeah. Hall and Nash against Team 3D. Retards! This is a all-cage pay-per-view, so this became a street fight. Falls County, anywhere in St. Louis. <laughs> yes, this is a street fight outside a steel cage. Yeah. So they brawled all over the place. They hit each other with stuff. They ended up going back into the cage because in a fall count anywhere match in the entire city, what better place to battle than inside the confines of a steel cage? They go inside. They laid out uh, Bubba outside the ring, so it was two-on-one with Steve on. Two matches after Lacey just opened the door and walked in. They tried to tell the story that Bubba was locked out and couldn't get in the cage. Well, Nash was holding the door shut, you see. I see. So Bubba hit the door with a chair, and the door opened up. Hell of a cage. So he got in. They did their spot. They put Hall through a table with a 3D. Hall and Nash versus Team 3D in a street fight in a steel cage was so much better than the X Division three-way. It's not even funny. Yeah. Two and a quarter stars, I guess. I went two and three quarter. Oh. I just had, to this point, by far, by far, the most heat on the show. And uh, the, only, the only other bit of stupidity... Taz, again playing in Brian and Vinny, pointed out that poor Kevin Nash had to work twice in the show and was at a disadvantage. The heels, again, are at a disadvantage. So there's that. I want to mention this because I'm in a mood of hate. We already talked about the Homicide, Kazarian, and Shannon Moore match, but there was a point here where somebody was doing a chokehold or in a face shake or something, and the referee began to count to five. Because you can be DQ'd in a cage match. In a freeway cage match. Yeah. Okay. You can. It's just that's how it works, Vince. I, I refuse to not be outraged by this. Mr. Anderson and Kurt Angle escaped the cage. Four and a quarter stars. It was a fantastic match, except for the spot, which I'll get to in a moment. The booking was, uh, there's a reason this was only four and a quarter. I know that some people will give it four and a half. Some will give it four and three quarter. The stupidity of some of the booking in this match 
took it down a notch with me. They they did a deal. Angle bled. They uh, they had a spot in here. This is actually great. Anderson started choking with his tape. Now, keep in mind, it has already been established in, like, three previous matches that you can be DQ'd in a cage match. Somewhere on this show, that rule was rescinded. As the referee did not give him a standing five count, as he had in the three-way, he just began trying to prevent Mr. Anderson from choking Kurt. He grabbed him by the hands and tried to stop him. This all failed. So, they keep doing this match. And uh, Angle starts to make this big comeback. And, uh, of course, Anderson is the key. And the only way to escape is to go out the door, but you have to open the door with the key. So, ends up with, uh, I guess, Angle giving him the slam, noticing that the key's in the lock, and he goes over, and he, instead of leaving, he locks himself in the cage with Anderson, and he throws away the key. This causes Mr. Anderson to begin freaking out because he is now locked in a cage with Kurt Angle. Yes, ten minutes into the match, he realizes he is locked inside a cage. This company is amazing. Just astounding. So he's afraid to be in a cage with Kurt Angle now. He starts running around and fleeing and that sort of thing. Angle beats him up, lays him out, and puts him in the corner, and he goes up for the moonsault. Now, when I saw him... Start going up, I thought, this fucker's going to go off the top of the cage. But then, I saw where Mr. Anderson was lying. He was very, very close to the ropes. And so I thought, well, he's not going off the top. You can't do a moonsault off the top and land on a guy who's that close to the ropes. It's, it's just not possible. But no, this guy keeps climbing. I'm like, so is Anderson going to jump up? What What is going to happen here? He cannot possibly be doing the moonsault with this guy this close to the ropes. So Kurt gets to the top, makes a sign of the cross. And in order to land on Mr. Anderson in the position he's in, Kurt has to jump almost straight up. Not up and back like a normal moonsault. He leaps almost straight up in the air. His head came so close to hitting the top of the cage on the way down, which, by the way, would have been the end of him. He would have hit his head on the top of the cage. It would have caused him to flip over a little faster. He would have landed on his head and neck and died. So he does this move off the top of the cage. He narrowly misses the metal with his head. He lands on Mr. Kennedy. I don't even know what he hit or how. He nearly killed himself. He nearly killed Mr. Kennedy. It was the most spectacular move I have seen in many years in TNA. And, of course, that's not the end. Kurt Angle kills him with this moonsault off the top. Sells like crazy for about 30 seconds. And then stands up and starts to go out the door. Which, by the way, he'd thrown away the key, you recall. Well, he just goes over and opens the door. There must be a second key, Taz says. Okay. Okay. Why not? I don't know. I don't even give a fuck at this point. So he's about to go out, and he looks over, and Mr. Anderson is flipping him off. Because you see, after taking a moonsault off the top of the cage from Kurt Angle, Mr. Anderson still won't die. He's like a movie monster. He's no longer even selling. So Kurt goes to continue the beating, and Anderson just jumps up and gives him the mic check. They wrestle for another two minutes. Finally, Anderson hits his move. He starts to go out the door. Kurt takes the medal. He starts to choke the guy out. Anderson is finally completely unconscious. Same finish as in the ladder match, just vice versa. Anderson goes to, or Angle goes to walk out the door. He stomps on, on uh, Mr. Anderson's nuts for good measure and leaves and wins. Everybody cheers. Gets on the ramp and uh, cuts his promo about how he's, he goes, some of you may not know this. Some of you may not, he says. Like, most of us are aware that he's taking time off. Because, you know, everyone's on the Internet. Explains he's taking time off, plans to come back and win the title, this, that, and the other thing. All i got to say is, like, the match was so good that it overcame 
everything that I was talking about here. Yes. To a degree. Exactly. <laughs> when you hear me review this match, it sounds significantly worse than it is, but this is a match that everybody should see. I I hated the moonsault. It it makes me want to boycott this show because, again, they don't give a fuck about anybody working for them. Kurt Angle did this in a match with Chris Benoit and nearly killed himself. This was ten years ago. And ten he hard years, years by the way. It's like he's been on the beach. Yes, things he's have been destroying his body for ten years. Worse for this guy in the last ten years. And here he does it again. Thank God he's taking time off. Thank God he didn't die. It was so ungodly stupid. The match would have been just as good without it. He... Anyway, four and a quarter stars. Watch this match. Don't ever do this stuff again, guys. I'm just going to go over my notes here. I would probably repeat a lot of what you said, but I've never seen a match that was so good despite so much stupidity. This is not the first time we've seen Kurt Angle nearly die. This is not the first time in like a month we've seen Kurt Angle nearly die. He nearly died like two weeks ago when he fell off a ladder, tumbled over the ropes into the floor. Why did he tumble off a ladder to the ropes, over the ropes into the floor? Because he was fighting for the key to this cage. The cage key on the big wood shop deal that Mr. Anderson finally got. So both men nearly died several times in that ladder match for the advantage of having this key. This key was so important in this match that it was worth life and death in the ladder match. So what happens? A minute in, Anderson goes to unlock the door, Kurt cuts him off, and they just leave the key in the lock. It is now neutral. Ladder match rendered null and void 60 seconds in. So that was stupid. Kurt Angle did start bleeding. Mr. Anderson, I don't say a lot of nice things about him, but his facials in this match were tremendous. The way he just leered at Kurt Angle, prone and bleeding and limp on the mat, and he leered at him with a look of pure hatred and rage. That was tremendous. So we had the, the director. <laughs> Mr. Anderson sets Kurt up against the cage, and he goes to run and hit the ropes on the side and then charge and run him into the cage. And the director is so stupid, he cuts away from that angle so we don't get to see the move. So he sucks even in a great match. The announcers began discussing how there are no submissions in this match, and that rule helps Mr. Anderson because then Kurt cannot win with the ankle lock. That is stupid because he can still break your goddamn ankle, and then you can't get out of the cage. Oh, Mr. Anderson was the first man on the show all night to realize you do not have to break on five, not even when you were choking a man with tape. So, yes, Kurt had the chance to win. He opted to go for the ankle lock instead. It lasted for about ten seconds. And then that was the, then there was a spot where uh, then Anderson... Anderson went to unlock the door, but Kurt slammed him and relocked the door and threw away the key. So this is here. They started the match over. Ten minutes in, and Anderson was terrified he was locked inside the steel cage. Before, he had been fine with being inside the steel cage. But now that the key's out, he's horrified. Then he started to climb, and Tanae said, you can't win the match by escaping. <laughs> so what were they supposed to do? Were they going to climb out, find the key in the crowd, climb back in, and then unlock the door? As it turns out, they just had a backup key we never heard about. So, they were fi fighting on, on the top rope. Kurt had a super German suplex. Mr. Anderson landed on his shoulder. That sucked. Then they did the giant moon spot, moon salt off the cage spot. And then, yes, Anderson jumped up from taking a moon salt off the top of a steel cage and kept fighting and, in fact, laid Kurt out with his finisher. So, he established the mic check is more devastating than the moon salt off the top of the cage. <sighs> And then finally, Kurt just choked him out and left. They were for like 10 minutes after the moonsault, I swear. Amazing like, stupidity. This was the best stupid match I've ever seen. Or, or the other way, the stupidest four-plus-star match ever. Yeah. I, I could not fathom how good it was, despite all this stupidity lying about like piles of crap. And we had the AJ Pope match. Three and three-quarter stars. I love this match. It also did have something awfully stupid. This time it was AJ doing a high cross off the top of the cage, missing and landing on his stomach on the mat. You have a child. You have children. So do you, Kurt. Stop doing this bullshit. They have this match. It was great. AJ got the heat. Pope made a comeback. They missed the aforementioned big thing off the top. Traded a bunch of near falls. And uh, as it was getting really quite great. Uh, and by the way, the heat for this was better than anything on anything in TNA in a long time. Uh, there were dueling chants of uh, Pope is pimping and let's go AJ. And I mean passionate chants by the crowd. And finally, as uh, the ref is distracted, AJ reaches through the hole that they filmed through. He grabs a pen from a cameraman. He pokes the Pope in the eyeball, and then he uh, hits a lariat, picks him back up, hits the Styles Clash for the pin, and uh, and that was that. Of course, you, you have to hide the poke to the eye from the referee, because again, you can have a disqualification in, in a, a world, world title, title match, match in, in a steel, steel cage. cage. Yes. 
Ric Flair was came out with AJ, and uh, he was immediately ejected to prevent him from interfering in the steel cage match. Yeah. Otherwise, he may help AJ cheat. Well, he, he undoubtedly would have, because it's a TNA cage. Yes. It's, it's, it's asking for you to So they ejected Ric Flair, and the crowd responded by chanting, We want Flair, louder than they later chanted for either AJ or Pope. And why would they do that? Because they love Ric Flair. Foresight being 2020 here. Yes. No fucking shit they were going to chant this. But the, the acknowledged on the show, this show was in Flair country. Yes. So they're dumb. And uh, there is a reason that WWE puts their... Uh, they, they, put the, they have a women's division, and they put the title matches late in the card, between the semi-main and the main. And if so, you have a chance to come down from the semi-main. I was still buzzing from the Angle Anderson match, and I, I was watching this match, and they were doing chain wrestling, and the heat was great, but I suddenly realized they were building toward the finish, and I had no idea what had happened prior. AJ missed a springboard, or excuse me, he, he hit a springboard 450, and Poe picked out of that, so AJ went to the top of the cage, and they went to the finish. So... I went three stars. It may have been better. It may have been worse. I'm really not sure because I was still focusing on Angle and, and uh, Anderson for the first two thirds of this match. Then we had Lethal Lockdown, a freak show booking disaster that nobody could possibly give a fuck about. I have no other way to describe this. <laughs> of course, Abyss and Robert Rude start. The same Abyss who was hit by a car. <laughs> On Monday. Six days ago. He's fine. Taz noted that it was stupid for a guy as fat as Abyss to start in this match. Yeah. <laughs> they claimed he had a hairline fracture of the hip, which he barely sold at all. They do a match. Rude raked his eyes. Taz again. How do you rake a man's eyes wearing a mask? There's a pause. Then he goes, well, I suppose you could probably get your fingers in the eye holes. I love so, Taz. So they brawl for five minutes. The segment ended, and who should come out but Rob Van Dam? Yes. Because the baby faces had the advantage. So between the baby faces having the advantage and the fact that he had come out two hours earlier, Rob Van Dam got absolutely zero reaction from the crowd. Yeah. He came in. He beat up Robert Roo for two minutes while the best lay in the corner. Yeah. Desmond Wolf came in to make the save. To make this a fair fight. To make this a fair fight. Only he was far more concerned with strutting and removing his robe in a dramatic manner than actually saving his teammate. So, thankfully for Robert Roode, he saved himself with what else but a low blow. Yes. So there's night of the fouls here at lockdown. So, nothing happened for a while until Jarrett came down to make it three on two. And what happened when it was three on two, everybody? I'll tell you. Because you have to have heat in war games. We had two heels beating up three baby faces. Yes, Jarrett climbed in the ring, and things went worse for his team. The baby faces had the advantage, and they were losing. They're still getting beat up. This so was now, I, just want to, I just want to explain this in the simplest terms possible for people that are confused. The baby faces had the three on two advantage, yet were getting beat up. They looked like complete tools. So, so, after two minutes of this, after two minutes of Jeff Jarrett making the worst run-in of all time, James Storm came down the ramp to help his team continue to win. Yes. So, as, as his three-on-three, three, as the heels have the heat in a fair fight, Jarrett takes it upon himself to make a comeback. Yeah. And rather than help his teammates out, he hits a long-delayed suplex. I was dying because there are six guys in the ring. Storm and Nigel are beating up RVD and Abyss. And meanwhile, Jeff Jarrett's just doing a babyface comeback. All by himself on Robert Roode. It was preposterous. So they cut to Chelsea. She had no idea what on earth was happening. No, just standing there looking completely stone-faced. Which, in fact, every time they cut to her, she had the exact same look I, on her face. They did. We'll get to that later. But yes. So Jeff came in to make it 4 on 3 to make the save for his team who was losing a fair fight. Only Sting had laid him out. Because Sting, you see, has been around long enough to understand how you fucking book a War Games match. So he took it upon himself to beat up Jeff Hardy so that there would actually be a heel advantage in this match. Now, this has been done one time before in the history of War Games and War Games type matches successfully. In the Ring of Honor CCW Cage of Death match, the Ring of Honor team, the Babyfaces, won the coin toss. But early in the match, Brian Danielson took out his teammate Samoa Joe and they were both gone. So for most of the match, despite having the advantage, the baby faces were in fact outnumbered. In TNA, they try to copy it, only they fuck it up so badly, it takes until the very end for them to do that. Yes. So, Jeff doesn't come down. It is uh, two minutes of three-on-three three in the ring. They do 
Beer Money and Jared and somebody else got in the corner, and they did a chain of eye rakes. A comedy spot that I would do in a wacky four-way opener in front of 50 people in Toledo, Washington. They did on pay-per-view. So, Steam came down. Moses on down to the ring. He makes a four-on-three. He has a bat in his hand. And then he called for the weapons. The bad guys used all the weapons. It was several minutes of trash cans and baseball bats and an axe handle and whatever else. Jeff Jarrett was still refusing to sell and making comebacks. By himself. Sting was moseying around, still wearing his trench coat. Yeah. He had not removed his trench coat yet. And uh, Jarrett, at the point, I guess when it was time, got knocked through the door to the floor. So Beer Money followed him out. They started to beat him up. Abyss got the tax out. He teased, choke slamming Sting, but James Storm hit him with a bottle to break it up. Only James Storm was miles away and not paying attention. So Abyss had to hook this choke slam, look out at the ramp, pose to the fans. Look out of the ramp. Desmond Wolf hit him. Abyss no sold it. Teased the choke slam. Storm finally ran in. Hit him with a bottle. Uh, the, fe- the heels all celebrated in the mid ring. Jeff finally ran down, had a stick, made a comeback. Staying somewhere in here, removed his heavy leather trench coat, but still had his t shirt on. He actually took a bump into the tax, which stunned me until I looked closely at his t shirt and he had like a life preserver on under it. He's not that stupid. He's a wise man. Yes. So. Hardy and Beer Money went to the top of the cage. There were weapons up there, just just in case. Yeah. Just in case they happened to go up there. Hardy and Beer Money were up in the cage for like five minutes. Nobody else up, appeared on camera. So they were up there doing stuff. Jeff takes them both out by himself, sets up a ladder, puts one of them on the on the uh, sets up a table, puts one of them on the table, climbs a ladder on top of the cage and hits a splash of the table. The place just goes absolutely insane. So he would have been, and this is a big ass cage too. So he probably was a legit 25 feet from the arena floor when he hit this move. TNA chose to shoot this with a camera on top of the cage. Of course. It looked no different than any other spot off a ladder you've ever seen. Of course. <laughs> He's imbeciles. So after he hits this, complete carnage everywhere. Carnage, devastation, human ruin. The crowd is just pissing themselves. And they cut to Chelsea. Yeah. Who, it may as well have been a still photo of the shot they used earlier. Yeah. <laughs> still had no idea what was happening or how to react. So Flair came down. Why not? Why not? Interference in War Games. He uh, attempted, he was so concerned about helping his team win that he tried to bite Abyss's finger off and steal the Hall of Fame ring. Yeah. This brought Hogan out. This brought Bischoff out mm-hmm. for the pay per view main event being decided by Hogan, Bischoff, and Flair in 2010. Bischoff tried to appease Hogan, tried to appeal to him, tried to reason with him, and finally talked him into surrendering Sting's baseball bat. Takes the bat, tosses it aside, and he pulls out brass knucks and flashes an evil grin. Ha ha! He has stabbed Hogan in the back. He teases, handing the knucks to Flair, and he turns and hands them to Hogan anyway. Yes. Why? Why? A swerve of a swerve. Why would you do this? A if, swerve. If this was real. Why would Bischoff fuck with Hogan's head like this? He fucked with Flair's head. I don't know. I don't either. So, Flair takes many shots with the brass knucks, bleeds all over the place, bumps into the cage, removes his shirt, and then bumps into the tax. Yes. Because he's insane. And after all of this, this devastation, Abyss picks up Desmond Wolf, hits a black hole slam on the canvas... Yes. And pins him at the end. This is the stupidest, most infuriating two and three quarter star match ever. That's Everything it. after Jeff ran down was actually really good, or at least at least entertaining. I guess everything before that was just so stupid. In fact, I will say this: everything after Jeff ran down at least got a good reaction. It got a good reaction. I will say that. I cannot say it was good. <laughs> everything before that was shit. You know what would have been nice if the announcers would have alerted us that Abyss pinned the guy that ran him over with the car, but they didn't. They will never mention that again. They it's didn't. in the past. So yeah, they, they did not men- They kept mentioning how important this was and all the power that went on with it. There was nothing on the line. There was nothing on the line in this match. And then Tanae said the issues between Hogan and Bischoff, Bischoff have been settled. How? It's too bad that TNA doesn't do a deal where they can just sell you each match. Like, I, I cannot, for the life of me, ask people to pay thirty four ninety five just to see the two matches here. I, I wish they just had a deal where, like, you could spend four ninety five for the Angle match and spend four ninety five for the Desmond Wolf match and then just be done with it. Just have spent $10, saw the two good matches, and you can move on with your life. 
I just cannot bring... I just cannot ask people to pay $35 of their hard-earned money for the rest of this fucking show. Angle and and uh, Kennedy was very, very good. Pope and Angle, very, very good. In fact, Angle and and, uh, and Anderson will probably get votes for best match of the year. It just probably will. I, I will say, the, the by the end of that match, we often sit, talk about how things feel like just another match, and especially in this one, where they have seen... We had seen every guy, you know, finish. We had seen this feud finish like five times. This felt like the biggest blow off match in years and years and years. This was not just another match. No. I will say that. But the rest of the show, utter shit. So. To the back! Yeah, impact, everybody. Who would have ever thought that this would have been the best show of the week? Not I. And by God, it was. Yes, it was. I've been told that next week's show sucks. Shocking. I'm sad. It's not like there's never been a good impact before. It's just that they can never maintain it. All right, go ahead and start. AJ came out. He had his suit. He had his belt. He said Flair had been up late partying. He'd be arriving later. Bragged about being the best wrestler in the world pound for pound, which is a strange thing to say when you're the heavyweight champion. Why don't you just say you're the best in the world? He's a small heavyweight, Dave said. (laughs) What he basically said was, I'm the best pound for pound, although those bigger guys are, in fact, better than me because they're bigger. So anyway, he was bragging and running his mouth off, and uh, Rob Van Dam interrupted, came out, said he had never been that impressed with AJ Styles. He was not impre- as impressed with him as everyone else was, and he said maybe AJ was the best wrestler, maybe he was the best athlete, but that was before RVD showed up. And uh, then Jeff Hardy came out, and as usual, he spoke nonsense. Something about having a large head but a small ego or something. I don't know. Everything he says goes over he my head. He said his, his actual head was large, like Tito Ortiz. Yeah. I guess I, I've never noticed. I don't know what the guy's talking about either. He was always hidden by his long hair. But anyway, he I guess he said he wanted a title shot. So Hogan came out, started talking about the title itself, how important it was, why, how uh, you know it, it led to all the money and all the fame and all the and all the notoriety and and just the honor of being champion, and that's why all the wrestlers wanted it. And he announced that... uh, He announced that he was booking RVD versus Jeff, and the winner would get a title shot, and this outraged AJ. He said he would not be ready by sacrifice, and Hogan would not clear this with him. And Hulk said, who said anything about sacrifice? At which point AJ said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you meant for then, which made me laugh. And Hogan, of course, booked the title match for that night. So, yes, RVD versus Jeff Hardy. The winner gets a title shot on this show. And uh, the crowd went crazy. The heat for this segment, and really for the entire show, but the crowd reaction for this was ungodly. Yeah. People were going nuts. Great crowd. Yeah. Which actually, it's kind of funny. I don't even know why this crowd was so great, because uh, our buddy Dan, Dan Adam, was happened to be in Florida, and he called me like an hour before the show or emailed me and said, how can I get in the impact zone? You think I'll be able to get in if I go out there? And I was like, well, you know, you can try. It's a live show. It's probably going to be packed, and, you know, you'll probably have a better chance at the tapings Tuesday. About 20 minutes later, he called and said, I'm in. <laughs> place is a lot smaller than it looks on TV. A lot of room here. So I don't know. Whoever the people were here, they were out of their minds. So. It seems to me sometimes when they do the out-of-town pay-per-views, it's like the impact zone crowd gets threatened. They may take Tina away, away from them, and they show up with extra passion the next night. Maybe that's just my imagination. Speaking of things that I wish were my imagination, Velvet and Lacey wrestled ODB and Daphne. Um, it was short. It was not very good. ODB had something sprayed in her eyes. She was blinded, and Velvet rolled her up for the pin. I have seen worse TV matches. I just loved ODB getting rolled up for the pin. And then Velvet walks away, and ODB acts like she's stuck on her back. She does not give a fuck. No. Why she, she realizes how shitty this is. No. Flair did a wacky promo, ranting and raving with AJ about how AJ could beat either guy. It didn't matter. And he said he wanted a Flair versus Team Hogan match later. And he said if it was not signed in five minutes, he was claiming victory via forfeit. I just wanted Borak to say, Yeah. <laughs> so what? Well, as it turns out, that was too much for for Team Hogan to take. When we we went to commercial, when we came back, Abyss and Jer were in the ring. They said they had heard about Ric Flair's challenge, and uh, they would accept it if it were not for the fact that half their team had already been booked in a match. 
So Team Fur came out in the ramp, basically said, too fucking bad. They all ran down. They beat up Jarrett and Abyss four on two. And who should make the save but Big fucking Rob? He ran down. He attempted to press land Desmond Wolf. Hogan spoke to his heart. He, he he attempted to press land Desmond Wolf and dropped him. He threw a kick at Sting and fell down. It was not his night. No, it yeah. really wasn't. But it was good enough, I guess, to clear the ring. Causing Flair to say, and I quote, Who are you anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love Ric Flair. Love Ric Flair. So, uh, Bischoff came out and announced that they were going to do a rematch later on the show. Team Flair versus Abyss and Jarrett and Rob Terry and a mystery man. I always love the mystery man. I, I always find myself hoping it will be the WCW mystery man in the... Yeah. In the, uh... The giant can? In the Michelin Man costume, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> costume made from a garbage can. He's the goddamn mystery man. Anyway. We have Matt Morgan meeting with Shannon Moore backstage... Sucking up to him, asking him to be his partner next week against Team 3D. Shannon said, I already have a match. Fuck off. Morgan was pissed. That was that. Awesome. Yeah. We had uh, Hogan <laughs> Hogan having a very happy meeting backstage with Eric. They confirmed that the point of pulling out the brass knuckles and teasing giving them to Flair and then giving them back to Hogan was just to fuck with Flair's head. That was the whole point. Mm-hmm. Great. <laughs> Whatever floats your boat. So they uh, they also talked about whether he would be there for sure, uh, implying this was the mystery man in the tag match. Eric said yes. And then Eric talked about a revolutionary new ranking system for the world title. Yeah. I have never had less faith in anyone doing anything than they have in TNA doing math. A revolutionary ranking system. As Dave noted last night, how do you have a revolutionary ranking system? I, I'm afraid. What could possibly be revolutionary about it? The ranking system cannot be just number one contender, number two, number three. Maybe it'll be eight number one contenders. And that's the revolutionary part. Maybe it will. I don't, I don't They've know. They've done that before, though. What if, <laughs> maybe there'll be eight number four contenders and no one higher. He, I don't know. I'm sure it'll be a disaster. Brooks' ass had to go get the files. And she never brought him back, by the way. No. And again, they don't put her in, like, pink tights or something like that that would accentuate her great ass. No, they put her in a skirt. They put her in a mini skirt. I know, but... Just from the side, I was perfectly fine with this camera angle. No. Put her in some, some pants that accentuate her ass. For fuck's sake. This is so easy, this shit. Jeff Hardy and RVD, number one contenders match. I gave it three and three quarter stars. I love this match. They uh, it's had a great wrestling match. The crowd went nuts. All sorts of near falls and such at the finish. The finish was perfect. The finish was great. It was Jeff shoving him off the top, going for the senton. RVD moved, hit the frog splash, one, two, three. Place went nuts. Clean finish. And it led to them going backstage after the match, watching a replay of that highlights. was an amazing segment. And the comments like... That hurt, and oh! Ho, ho. Yes. This was the best segment ever. <laughs> I, I would be fine, especially with RVD, but anytime you have two guys going over their own highlights, I am fine with this being a weekly deal. Yeah, that would be tremendous. The match, I don't know, was good. It was. They both did all their spots. They worked really hard. They went back and forth. The crowd was chanting, this is awesome, and I was like, this is above average. And it's not nearly as bad as when they chanted, this is awesome, during that three-way on the pay-per-view, but it was three-ish. He stars this. And, R- and the finish was awesome. RVD won clean. Everyone went crazy, and so it all led to the main event. So, yeah, thumbs up. Very good match. Mm-hmm. Three and three-quarter stars, everyone. I almost went four, but it just wasn't long enough. We had Abyss ranting and raving about how Team Flair jumped him. I know we've said this before, but Abyss's babyface promos are so awesome. He is great. He is awesome. He had this man silent for like six years. So presumably he's turning heel within the next month. <laughs> you would think. So he said Big Rob had raised his game, and Rob said by the end of the night, everybody would know he was the freak Rob Terry. By the way, I haven't seen all of the Impact spoilers, but uh, I don't think Rob Terry's even on next week's show. Please explain this. I don't know. He was a centerpiece of this fucking show. Speaking of people who are not on Impact, I was going to mention this at the start, but I forgot. Pope was not on the show, presumably selling his eye injury, mm. although I don't think they ever even mentioned him. They showed clips at the very beginning 
of uh, highlights of the pay-per-view. They showed him getting stabbed in the eye, stabbed in the eye with a pen and pinned, and uh, that was it. Would have been nice to, uh, you know, Pope's give been us an blinded, everybody. on the man Pope's who going to be fine. Stabbed in an eye. Pope's nursing a hangover or something. Yeah. They also had a few points during the show. They aired a little crawler along the bottom of the screen that just had, just had the pay-per-view results. I thought that was a great idea. Let's talk about the uh, next segment here. Let's keep the show moving on here. We the had War the games this dealy. War games. How do you... As good as this show was, it still cannot help but be TNA. All right. Let's do a War Games match without a cage. And when you See, get in the ring, it becomes a tag team battle. When they first explained this, I actually thought it's a really good idea because with... And, it had, this, happened to, and this happened at the pay-per-view... When one ring with a cage around it and eight guys, there's no room to do anything. That's why they ended up brawling on the floor and stuff. So if you have it without the cage in one ring, well, they can go on the floor, they can go in the crowd, whatever. It's did the tag match. Now, fortunately, the guys were smart enough to work it so that with five seconds to go in every single period, they would do a double down. So the guy would walk down the ramp and immediately get a hot tag. Yeah. But it came off very contrived. This was... Stupid. The finish was great. Where oh god, it yes, ended up being Joe. He came down. He beat the fuck out of everybody in sight, and then pinned Robert Roode with the muscle buster. Two thumbs up for the finish. Joe came down. He had no makeup. He had no pajamas. He had the old black and white spandex shorts. Looks slimmer. Whipped everyone's ass in an amazing display. One with the muscle buster. He seemed like the scariest dude on earth. Here. This yeah. was a win. And then he refused to celebrate with his teammates and walked to the back, so he is still angry, Joe. Yeah. They went AJ and RVD for the world title. Another very good match. RVD still bleeding after his first match of the evening, which he got busted open the same wound he had on Sunday. I like what they pointed out. This was his fourth match in about 24 hours. Yeah. So that is indeed a major disadvantage. That's right. So he came out. They had a... uh, a really fun little match here. I thought it was a little clunky early on. They uh, tried their usual AJ doing the uh, leapfrog, drop down, drop kick, but he actually legitimately tripped RVD. And RVD tried to leap up just in time to get drop kicked in the face, and he did. They did such a good job saving this. This is, yeah. That it was even better than if they'd actually done it right. I was. It's one of those things where. People trip. It, it happens. People trip on on the uh, drop down. Rob Van Dam tripped on the drop down. <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. But they covered it. Actually, I thought they covered it really great just because they made eye contact briefly and AJ just walloped him in the face with both feet. Yes. And the crowd all went, ooh, and it was forgotten. So, yeah, they did this match. Last few minutes were awesome. Tons of, of near falls. Finally, AJ went for a springboard. RVD power bombed him in midair, jumped up to the top, hit the frog splash for the pin. Clean pin right in the middle of the ring. Mm-hmm. Place went nuts. They uh, dropped the red and yellow confetti. Hogan came out, got the belt, got Dixie. They all got in the ring. All the baby faces were down there. Yep. Locker this, room emptied. This, it was very clear, was a big deal. Yeah. This is a big deal to everyone in the company. Yeah. It was a, a giant party. Rob's music played all the way through. <laughs> they were partying so long. AJ can do nothing but look off from ringside and cry. This I, to- I can bitch in some ways about this show. Like how, you know, they blew through three months of storylines in one night. Or whatever. You know, I didn't even mind that. No, no, I'm just saying. I'm saying yeah. I could bitch about this. But I'm not going to. Because they had a great show here. The important thing is the follow-up. I don't know what the follow-up's going to be next week. I'm not going to judge it. Reports are not good. But who knows? Who knows? I've gotten reports before about Impact not being good, and it actually ended up being pretty good. So we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt here. They had the goddamn best show of the week. Yes. So I, I am not going to bitch. Without question. If you have to do three months' worth of storylines to have the best show of the week one time, fine. <laughs> Just get back on track next week. You can't do this every week. I Well, that, that is definitely true. But uh, if AJ ends next week with the belt back, it's all for naught. But people who complain about, uh, you know, like you say, they did three months of angles in one night, they could have just had Rob win the number one contendership here and done the match of the pay-per-view, but then it would have just felt like 
just another TNA pay per view with AJ defending as the challenger of the month? Well, why couldn't they have? Uh, they, I mean, they could have had him beat Jeff tonight and then win the title next week. They could have spread it over two shows, I suppose. But Especially if next week's show sucks, I'm going to be even sadder. Well, that's true. But, <laughs> but just just having it this sudden. So I, I am more interested in a pay-per-view with Rob defending against AJ than it would be with AJ defending against Rob. Yeah. If that makes any sense. No, but I'll take your word for it. Fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's different. It's all yes. Who has the title? The, the difference is I've seen AJ defending the title for a while now, and this would have just been another time. Mm-hmm. Uh, having, having Rob as the champion is something fresh. To the back! Vincent? Oh, yes? <laughs> is there some news? Yes. You realize that Impact did 8.5. That's low. There are threads everywhere on the board. When I walked in the door, I actually expected you to be holding a camera. (laughs) You haven't even mentioned anything until we started. What's that? Why, this is my iPhone with video capability. Oh, really? Yes, it is. Isn't that convenient? Vinny, you know you're going to have to pony up here. I am a man of my word. (laughs) I will say... I feel bad doing this because the whole when I first made this promise to as if anyone here doesn't know what I'm talking about, I promised to do a little dance if Impact ever did a 0.5, and I said that because I figured if they did an 0.5, I would be happy. <laughs> but now the shows have gotten better, and the ratings are going down, so I don't actually feel like celebrating. I feel bad for Impact. Well, maybe you can do some sort of sad lurching dance. <laughs> Which I figured it was going to be anyway. Well, but they may turn out that way whenever we want. I'll make you deal, Vinny. Mm-hmm. I'll make you do the dance at the end of the show. That's probably for the best. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, because I'm going to be blown up at the end anyway. I'm going to build this up, and then when it's time, I got my phone right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I made it do a sound effect. There. Sounded like a uh, sounded like a a uh, a gun clicking, for example. Let me just do that one more time. That's right. I'm going to open this little fucker up right here, and we're going to film you doing a wacky dance. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. Get some music on somehow. We don't need music. I disagree. Well, I don't have any music here. There's nothing I could use. I, so. a laptop. I have a speaker on my laptop. So you do a dance with the headphones on. I, my laptop has speakers. I see. It's All very right. low quality. If, if you play Wild and Young, though, I'm going to start throwing <laughs> shit at you. That's not the song you're going to play. Never crossed my mind. That is not the song you're going to play. I'm I'll talking something on I here. have cans, I have bottles, including one very hard plastic bottle that I will be lobbing at you if you play that fucking song for your dance. Will not be allowed. So anyway, I'll give you some time to think about that, to stew it over a little bit, and then I'll... Uh, I, should, I thought about this. I should go back and reread Impact Reports from like this time last year. That'll get me good and angry. Then I'll be happy about their 0.5. Well, I can go back and, and find one if you'd like. Maybe we should try. I could find the Christmas tree edition, <laughs> the barbed wire Christmas tree. That's, the, I think, the most famous bad uh, Impact episode. I don't even know why we're waiting until the end, because it's a tape show, and the moment this show goes up and there's a link to you dancing, it's the first thing everybody's going to click. That's true. But it'll build up towards it. Everybody, if you're listening to this right now, don't click the link until the end of the show. Let's, uh, that would be cheating. Yeah, let's not cheat here. You better not be typing W-I-L-D into that Google right there. How dare you? You just don't do it. And don't play any songs yet. Come on. Have my mute on. Impact. Hogan came out, talked a little bit. We talked about how important the TNA title was. Briefly mentioned the brand new top ten ranking system set of all the fans. And then he began to get awesome. After touching on how important the title was at the opening of the promo... He said RVD and Jeff Hardy had him on the edge of his seat last week. Said Jeff Hardy and AJ, the two guys Rob beat, were both two of the greatest wrestlers anywhere, anytime. And Rob beat them. So he was the fucking man. This was tremendous. Just talking about how blown away he was by the quality of the competition here in TNA and Rob Van Dam, their champion. Great stuff. So he called out Rob. Rob came down. He had the belt. He had his music. Got the microphone and said, and I quote, Thanks, Hulky. Called him Hulky several times in the segment. He said, You don't need to call him Mr. Monday Night anymore. You can just call him Mr. TNA. Said he came to TNA because Hulk and Dixie and Eric Bischoff would, said it would give him a fair opportunity just to be himself. Talked about weed and being a laid-back dude. He kicks ass. Was Crumbly's threat on the board just the stupidest thing? What a mentalist he's become. It was a, it was a dumb argument. What an idiot. Oh, uh, 
Of all the things to argue about, listen, that was dumb. Listen, when we say this is a poor message to send to children about weed and pot smoking, don't bring up, well, would it be appalling if, if TNA did an angle involving jaywalking? Well, first off, that's a stupid example, because I don't want my kids watching shows about fucking jaywalking. Having them run across the street with cars coming? Yeah, jaywalking is bad. Second off, it doesn't matter whether you think it should be legal or not. That has absolutely fucking nothing to do with the argument. The fact is, it's legal. You cannot compare a tag team that drinks with a guy who smokes weed. You just can't. Unless you're a complete idiot. Go on. So, uh, it was not a great promo by Rob, but he did end by saying he was the toughest dude you'll ever see, and he vowed to be the greatest champ ever. So that was a good line, good line to go out on. So AZ and Flair came out, they were angry, and right before they got in the ring, Rob, in his best line, just said, you didn't like my promo. <laughs> that made me laugh. So AJ tore into Rob, said nobody understand, stood him, said, you're just a hippie freak from Southern California, and nobody understands you, dude. Said Rob won the title because he, AJ, slipped on the top rope. He accused Rob of lubing the ropes. So he would get his rematch when he wanted it. And then Flair yelled at Hogan for giving his Hall of Fame ring to Abyss. Said he had trusted others to get the job done and he was going to take care of business himself tonight. And he said, you make a mockery of Ric Flair, you die. Die, he said. Die. Terroristic threat. Sure. This was a fun segment all in all. It was I thought, it, you know what, it's, it's weird. It's like... I think it, I may have. I think I like it more because in hindsight it was like the best thing on the show. But as it was taking place, it felt like it was going on too long. It went for a long time. Like at one point, I actually had to check and see how long is this fucking segment right here. It just felt really, really long. But by the time the rest of the show was over, I was like, "Huh, can we have this promo here again with these guys?" So we had a short, beautiful people promo. They were bitching about Madison defending her title in a three-way. They never mentioned who her, who, who her opponents were. They did at the very end. But they you did. had to wait until the very end of this interview for her to mention who this three-way was with. I didn't even catch it. What they, is wrong with the people writing the show? They don't know what they're doing. I mentioned this last night on the Dave show, but they had an interview with Orlando Jordan where he didn't, for a single moment, identify himself. No. And when they went back to the announcers, they didn't identify him. No. Not a single time. No. Not a single time on this entire show were the words Orlando Jordan mentioned. Nope. How can you do that? Complete because they idiots. don't know what they're doing. Complete idiots. Well, they know what they're doing now more than they did two weeks ago. This is much improved. Yeah, so improved we got still a point TNA. five. It's still TNA. Well, it did get a point five. So we had Angelina versus Tara versus Madison. It does result in you being doing a dance, so mm, this is all a dance. They do know something. <laughs> so you're suggesting it was their goal? They have been successful their in some way. Their goal was to get me to dance. Yeah. They want to sacrifice their own show to get me to dance. Sure. There are easier ways to do this. To, to, hum- to humiliate you, they cheaper got a point five. Throw, throw a few thousand dollars my way. I would have done it for much cheaper than throwing your company down the, down the toilet. So they had this match. There was a point where Tara had a snap suplex on Madison and then rolled through and hooked a guillotine. And Madison was completely fucked. And uh, Angelina was on the floor or something out of the picture. And I thought, this is the finish for sure. And then they just both stood up. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, Taz was talking about getting the hooks in and how this would be the finish. And he was so confused, he just trailed off in mid-sentence. <laughs> this was TNA in a nutshell. So Angelina did Who get in the Who is the agent for the girls now? I don't know. Can they get someone with a clue? Can you bring back Scott Demore or something? So Angelina came back in. She made a fun comeback, and then Madison shoved them both together in such a manner as to somehow have Angelina catch her arm and tear his leg brace and tear it all to shreds. So that sucked. And uh, fortunately, it was the finish. Unfortunately, they had to be a post-match brawl. Yeah. That always sucks. So Tara, of all people, was the one who was crying, and then they were fighting again. Injury aside, the brawl at the end was just total overkill. Yeah. This also went too long. We get it. You don't like each other. You both lost. You you cost each other the match, sort of. And now you crazy. can't wrestle each other. Now you can't wrestle each other. So we had Shannon Moore versus Kazarian. My first thought was, again, and then I remember the last time they wrestled, it was really good, so I was fine with that. This was not that good. This is not as good as the last time. Kazarian still does not have his belt. I guess this was... This must have been a tape show, but it still made me laugh. It's been, like, forever now. 
they had a crawler doing on the bottom of the screen that was doing like pay per view results and plugging house shows. And then it mentioned that Jarrett and Sting had been signed for sacrifice. That's how they announced the match. Yeah. If you were not, if you were looking Which away from the TV, by the way, because I didn't see this. Yes. If you're looking away from the TV and not watching the very bottom of it, you would not know that match was signed. So they were doing the deal. They realize that small print is used in advertising, <laughs> so do you hope people don't, don't see it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So there was a ref bump. Uh, Shannon went up top, and the camera then cut to Matt Morgan running down the ramp like the director knew it was going to happen. So the director was in on this plot, plot to shoot to screw Shannon Moore. So Morgan ran down, knocked Shannon off the top. Kazarian hit his the pile driver where he holds the guy over his back. And the reason the guy doesn't do this move very often is because Shannon Moore's head did not come within six inches of the mat. <laughs> it looked bad. His mohawk did. But uh, then Kazarian pinned him. It either doesn't come within six minutes or you smash your head on the ground and almost die. Or you don't smash your head on the ground and almost die. So the other solution is, hey, director, use a different camera angle. So... Kazarian won, and then Samoa Joe came out and killed him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, the lesson is, don't have good matches like Shannon Moore and Frankie Kazarian, or you'll be buried by big men like Samoa Joe and Matt Morgan. Remember when Dixie was talking about how awesome the X Division was? No. Well, <laughs> I believe you. I was saying, I don't remember it. It was uh, Destination X. Oh, oh yeah. That's we were talking about. so important that it was great to have one pay-per-view a year. They could be in the main event, which was in the middle of the show. Yeah, one. it tells you something right there. They get one pay-per-view a year to be in the main event, which was in the main event, I might add. But Yeah. We had an Abyss oh, promo man. talking about the ring and what it meant to him. Said it did not have magical powers. He knew that. But it meant that Hulk Hogan had believed in him. You know, I hated this promo. And that meant he believed in himself. Because... Abyss did a promo just basically saying, if I lose, oh well. Yes. I know what the ring means to me. He said he may, might lose the ring, but he'll never lose what the ring has given him. How stupid. Don't well, you get a case, promo and say, I know, I'd die before I lost yes. this ring. I guess why even fight? Just hand the damn thing over. Here. Yeah, you know what it means to you. Save yourself trouble. Just throw in the uh, toilet while you're at it. So stupid. We had Matt Morgan appealing to Jesse Neal about being his tag team partner tonight. Here is where I thought, why are Jesse Neal and Shannon Moore not a tag team? Well, I got my wish. So Morgan brought up the dead soldier. I don't know how I feel about that. And uh, then we had AJ and Sting versus Jeff Hardy and Jeff Jarrett. We were after the match began. We were told this was false count anywhere and anything goes. So they did crowd brawling for a long time, and then it broke down into a tag match. And then after they had broken down into a tag match, Jeff came in without a tag. Jeff Hardy came in without a tag, and just stayed in running wild. And the ref just stood in the corner. So I had no idea what was going on. It was a false count anywhere anything goes tag team match where they just decided to follow the rules in the middle. For a while. And then they stopped. And after Jeff ran... <laughs> Damn it. After Hardy ran wild and AJ for a while, Sting was so confused, like myself, he threw up his hands and went to the back. I didn't blame him. Just walked away. So now AJ was left two-on-one advanced baby faces. And Jeff Jarrett, rather than help his partner... And win, went after Sting. What an idiot. <laughs> so Hardy and AJ were fighting on the ramp, and Jarrett walked by them on camera. Just mm-hmm. walked on by, leaving his partner to, to his own fate. So they brawled in the rafters. The finish, I think the finish was a good idea on paper. No, yeah. it wasn't. The execution blew. Vince, yes. you read this on the piece of paper that says, Jeff Jarrett pinned on stairs. Not that part. Okay, that's you're, not the part I'm referring to. Because that's impossible. <laughs> that was not you could not you could not even pin the midget blue monkey on the stairs. <laughs> there is no flat surface on stairs in which to put both of your shoulder blades. Yes, By right, definition, you cannot be pinned on fucking stairs. Your you head morons. will get in the way. God damn idiots! That okay? That's not the part. This I'm whole referring match to. was just a booking clusterfuck of disaster. But while Sting was pinning Jarrett outside, Hardy T's jumping off a ladder on the stage, threw AJ through a table on the floor, which would have been. Suicidal, frankly. And uh, he didn't get to, because before he climbed the ladder, Sting pinned Jarrett, and so the match was over, and so the referee took it upon himself to protect AJ from further damage. The matter of the way. That part I liked. But because... Wait, you liked how when the bell rang, it was no longer anything well, okay. goes, and men must be protected? Forget... Okay, pretend this is not TNA for From a second. From bell to bell, you could be killed. But my God, yes. once that bell rings, sure. save the men's lives. Sure. But, yes, yeah, so meanwhile, Sting was pinning Jarrett... On stairs in the back, so Jeff Hardy couldn't even really see them. They couldn't see Jeff. They didn't know what time was going on. It did not work. Lame. We had Jesse Neal asking Team 3D for their blessing. 
to wrestle with Matt Morgan against them. They joked about it at first, but they decided they liked his gumption. They told him to go for it, and then they said they had to go take care of that other thing. His gumption. And they did not use that exact word. Okay. Made a Pope promo. He had a diamond-studded eye patch and a sling. Still looking great. He vowed revenge on AJ, promised an eye for an eye. I cannot do this promo justice. It was fucking fantastic. And uh, then he was done. And then Mr. Anderson came out. Mm. Time stopped. This guy just interviews suck. And he, even before the chicken noises, <laughs> even before that, he was rambling on, calling the fans rubes or whatever. And even the Pope told him to get to the goddamn point. You know, even seeing his promo, there was some stuff that I could find to like about it. He had a couple of jokes that were kind of funny. Mr. Anderson's promo was so... Such turn the channel heat. There's nothing good about it. Such I quit Impact forever because of you, Heat. Even I... Uh, I at least laughed when Cena pulled his cell phone out of his shorts and said, that's why I wrestle in jean shorts. That one line was funny. There was nothing that funny here in this Ken Anderson promo. So eventually, Pope uh, slapped him with his good hand, and Anderson attacked him, went for the eye, and the refs pulled him off. So apparently they're going to wrestle a sacrifice. Anderson did challenge him, and Pope slapped him, so I guess that's a yes. We had Team 3D versus Jesse Neal and Matt Morgan. Team 3D prepared for their tag team title match by murdering Sean Waltman. Yeah. They, they cut to the back. Waltman was on cement through a table in a pool of blood. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, then, then we got the stupidest match of all time. I hate this match even more today. <laughs> You're not calm down. Jesse Neal. Jesse Neal. First off, if you took Matt Morgan and you had him do this exact same gimmick, he would be a babyface. You would think. He's a man defending the titles all by himself. Yes. He outsmarts everyone. Yes. He's a one-man wrecking crew. Right. In, T- in TNA, he's the heel. Right. So then they put in Jesse Neal with him. A goddamn idiot. Team 3D even told him, did you not see what happened to Red last <laughs> they week? They warned him about exactly what happened. Jesse Neal's explaining, I want to go out there and become the tag team champions. And they're like, well, how are you going to do that? And he said, by beating you. So my question is, so... If he beat Team 3D, he would officially become the tag team champions? I suppose. Well, where's Hernandez? What is going on here? Hernandez is this apparently dead. makes no sense. So, Jesse Neal goes in there. Of course, Hernandez, or, or uh, uh, Morgan fucking turns on him. Morgan beats the crap out of him. Uh, they go to commercial. They come back. Jesse is screaming at Morgan, saying he wants more. Matt Morgan gets threatened by Hulk Hogan, goes back to the ring. Jesse Neal attacks him. Matt Morgan beats him up. Again. Yes. Lays him out again. Right. What a fucking goofball that Jesse Neal looked like on this show. Yes. Because these people don't know what they're doing. There is such... This is like, no matter how good the shows are, with rare, rare exceptions, they have absolutely no idea what is a good guy and what is a bad guy. This is like the first stories ever put on stone tablets did this right, okay? This is not something new. This is not a mystery. What constitutes a hero and what constitutes a villain? These fucking people can't figure it out. How can you not figure this out? If you've ever read a book, if you've ever read in your life a single novel, if you've ever watched a single fucking movie, this is not rocket science. This is not even arithmetic. This is the most basic story in the history of man. Genesis. All the way back to the fucking beginning. It's not hard to figure out. God, these people are stupid. Every fucking show. There's got to be the heels overcoming the odds. There's got to be the baby face made to look like an imbecile. Every fucking show. Stop that. You wonder why people think your fucking show is so stupid. All right, go on. So after Morgan laid Jesse Neal out, who should make the save but Shannon Moore? And he came out, sent Morgan packing. The two Mohawk men stood up, congratulated each other, made funny faces and hand gestures. The crowd chanted Mohawk. Why would these guys even be a team? 
They have the same haircut. Okay, but at least Shannon Moore was smart enough to realize Matt Morgan's going to fucking turn on me. Mm -hmm. Last week, he didn't even fall for it. Jesse Neal's too goddamn stupid. Right. What do these guys have in common? Certainly not IQ. The haircut. God annoyed me. Someone looked around and said, hey, we have two Mohawk guys. Let's put them together. So, did we even mention the, the Holland Nash right now and they had a brawl? And by the way, does this mean that Jesse Neal and Shannon Moore are going to be challenging Matt Morgan by in himself? a handicap match? God, I hope so. <laughs> Again, you fucking morons. Orlando Jordan did his promo where he never mentioned his name a single fucking time. This this second hour of this show, I hate it with a passion. And the more I look at it, the more I hate it. Stupid you stuff. You also skipped over Bischoff announcing his new ranking system. Oh, yeah, revolutionary. Was eagerly awaiting with bated breath. It's a fan poll. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long and short of it. You go on, he encouraged us to go on the website and vote early and vote often, and it will be a fan poll. You vote, and then Dixie, Hogan, and Bischoff will take your vote into consideration when deciding who the number one contender is. So then... Isn't it about who wins? You know. Well... well in UFC, Anderson Silva wins all the time, but if he was not champion, he would never get a title shot. It's about who entertains the fans the most. It's just lame. I don't know. So, Lethal came at the end of this. He started rattling off his top ten, which included a bunch of 1980s names, including, of all people on this night, the Hart Foundation. Yeah. And then they immediately cut away. Yes. On the night, the Hearts won the tag titles. Oh, so we got the weird Ric Flair segment. I understand Dave hated this. Um... Didn't uh, didn't they start doing a whole show that was basically segments like this? Like the start, it went right before Impact. They had it one time, it got a bad rain, and they canceled it. Yeah, apparently they just had all the footage left over and just stuck it here on Impact. Because that appeared to be what this is. So, Well, it, they couldn't have done that because these were all new interviews. I see. They're just filming it in a different way. No, it failed. <laughs> so it was Ric Flair speaking very quietly. He was not being the nature boy. He was speaking what I guess is a normal voice, and thank God they had subtitles, because he mumbles a lot. And uh, he looked very old, scarred, beaten, broken. And uh, as, as we would find out later, it looked like anything would make him start bleeding again. And uh, then he talked about Steve Austin. <laughs> and getting his Hall of Fame ring in front of 16,000 people. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, uh, I would not have put this on my show. I don't think it helped. We had a Hall and Nash promo. They were angry and defiant about their little buddy being taken out by the... Their little buddy was taken out two-on-one by Team 3D, and they vowed revenge. Yeah. How are they not baby faces? Because these people are idiots. Nash, in particular, came off... He had such great baby face fire here. Yes. Hall was trying to calm him down, trying to be... He spoke to the cameraman, said, I'm, the cameraman said, I'm the nice guy. And Nash promised they, were, they would get a third man and would come back for revenge. Has Dixie never read a book? Say what you will about Dixie, but has she never watched, like, a soap opera? Guaranteed she has. Guaranteed she's watched Titanic, okay? Guaranteed she's watched a movie. You can't watch this and figure out that it's ass backwards. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this pisses me off. Yeah, so, so, to review, their little buddy got taken out two-on-one, and so now they are bringing in a superhero to save the day. That was the point of this promo. So the odds will be even, because right now they're uneven. I guess, I don't know. I can't keep track anymore. So we had Ric Flair versus Abyss. As I noted, Ric Flair's skin was ready to be cut open at anything at a moment's notice, and it did. I don't think he gigged. I think it's just... But it was this taped two days after the pay-per-view. Yeah. So he did a massive blade job there, so it had not healed yet. That's why he's bleeding on all the shows, everyone. It's because they were filmed in 24 or 48 hours or whatever. There was less heat for this match than for anything else in the show. It was not very good. Um, Abyss no sold brass knucks. Nobody even cared about that. So Flair punched him in the dick with the brass knucks, and he won. Only the ref started. The ref caught him with the knucks, restarted it, and Abyss hooked up and won with a black hole slam. This was no good. It sucked. <laughs> it did. Yeah, it was all right. That was the end of impact. But Ric Flair being sixty-one and. In a match with Abyss, it was fine. I suppose, but... But yeah, point five, everybody. Mm -hmm. And Vinny's about to do his dance here. Okay, Vinny, now's the time. You're all set? Let me uh, let me do the, the sound here again so that everybody can uh, hear it. Let me, uh, what, what sound what are you doing? Should I introduce this so everyone can see the... Uh, 
studio at work here. Why don't you stand up and get ready? I'll, I'll start my stretching. All right. And we can't go too long because the file will be way too big. So, uh... I don't know how long you expect me to dance. I realize I'm off the mic. And by the way, I hate to tell you this, freeloaders, but this is only for subscribers. That makes me happy. <laughs> this is video that I am uh, producing right here. I, I apologize for that, but it's just the, uh, the way it's got to be done. All right. Uh, all right, here we are at the... Uh, you can kind of see the whole uh, setup here. I have no idea what people can see. We're about to uh, watch Vinny do his wacky dance. So, uh, Vinny, here we go. You loading up music? It's planned. I'm a scat man. Look at this fucking patty. Wow! 0.5! <laughs> I wish I could watch this live. <laughs> oh, Vinny. <laughs> All right. That was your finest moment. <laughs> okay. I cannot wait to upload that fucker.